welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. Shut up and grind some tape. Yeet. It's already Thursday. Cannot believe it's already Thursday. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to the Film Guy Network on a terrifically loaded Thursday evening here on the network. We say it every week when this show comes around. Hey, hours seven and eight, the last show of the week, last show, best show. We got a great one for you tonight. Tonight's opening statement right here for you. Greed prevails. The veil has been lifted. We have known it for a long time. Money did some big talking in the world of college football today, as we expected before we've seen before we've even seen a 12 team playoff. Uh, it was announced and finalized today that we will be actually going to 14 by the year of 2026. How? I don't know what has been finalized. Nothing. Just other than the fact that we will definitely be going to, uh, you know, 14 team playoff by 2026. And let's be honest, greed playing a role in college football decision making is nothing new to this audience. It's nothing new to the audience of college football, um, nor is your disdain for greed playing a role in the decisions that have been made around the world of college football. It seems like, I don't know, the last 24 months, I don't know of a single decision that's been made in the world of college football that has been a resounding success. In fact, most of the decisions that have been made around this sport, its constituents, its customers have been like, yo, what the hell? What are we doing? Right? This was one of those today. Uh, again, your, your, your uh, awareness that money has played a role and your disdain for money playing a role is nothing new to these kind of proceedings around the world of college football. However, um, today's news wasn't just about greed. It wasn't just about money. Um, it was about exerting power and showing power uh, and wielding that power and doing so uh, quickly and, 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 you know, pretty didn't have much backlash or much pushback from those uh, that you're, you know, showing that power to. Uh, the SEC and the Big Ten, it was announced today and finalized and agreed upon unanimously. Uh, the, the SEC and the Big Ten will receive 52% of this new rev revenue split. It will put them at about $21 million per year, and the rest of the uh, non-power, or the Power Five, I should say, the non-Power Two, the rest of the Power Four uh, at about $12 million annually. They will get 52%. The ACC and the Big 12 will get 38%, and 10% will go to the non-Power Four, right? The mid-majors left in the world of college football. And perhaps after this news and perhaps after this expansion to 14, I, I put the veil has been lifted at the top of the show notes because I think finally we have come to the understanding as a national audience. I know the local audience here on this channel, those who tune in every single night to this network, we talked about it last week, how guys, from now on, good, bad, ugly, whether you agree with it, whether you disagree with it, whatever, whether it, it, is, it is for the betterment of the, the world of college football or whether it ends the world as we know it of college football, all of the credit, blame, all the good stuff goes to Greg Sankey. And I think finally, after today's decisions, particularly if you read the reporting on this, he made it very, very clear. We, 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 we own this. We the big boys, all right? In fact, I've put in 40% of the college football playoff members since this joker has started in 2014. My conference, 40%. The rest of you jokers bringing in about 60%. We'll bring the Big Ten in because they got all this money and they, you know, win a title every once in a while. Shout out to Michigan and Ohio State. But the rest of you guys, y'all are peons. Y'all y'all are lesser than. Y'all are at least 14% lesser than on the, on the total grand scheme of things, right? Um, and that was shown today. And I think, again, we told you last week, but I think – at least my mentions told me today that people are finally, guys, catching on to, oh, this was Greg Sankey's doing, right? Because Tony Petiti just got here. This is a new face, man. That dude's been here for a calendar year, right? He just showed up. Greg sankey been pulling these strings for a little minute now, right? And here we go, 14-team playoff. Not only do we open up a different revenue split, not only do we automatically separate these two conferences from the rest of them, but we're also on the doorsteps, boys, if you've done all the reading from the SEC and the Big Ten getting at least three automatic bids into this newfound college football expansion playoff into 14 teams by 2026. That hasn't been finalized, but if any of these proceedings have shown us anything, 
If Greg Sankey mentions it, that he wants it, his ass going to get it. This conference is going to get it. So if the SEC wants three automatic qualifiers, if they want 52% of the revenue share, if they want to be big bad boys on campus because Greg Sankey says so, then it can't nobody really do much other than say, yes, sir, we're going to 14. And sure, in a couple of months, we'll agree that you can get three automatic bids. Welcome in, boys. How are we doing today? Doing fantastic. I mean, you got to feel pretty petrified if you're one of these ACC or Big 12 teams, especially if your name is not – Florida State or Clemson or maybe even like a Utah or whatever else, you know, kind of what we talked about the other night. But, I mean, if you're not one of these teams, you kind of just like, well, I mean, heck, it feels like we were did what we were supposed to before this because we felt like coming to the Big 12 or coming to the ACC, like if you're Stanford, was the right move for us because it kept us from being sitting ducks over in the Pac-12 or the Pac-2 now is what it is. And now you're like, well, geez, this seems like now that's not even enough. And maybe we just get left out of this entirely here in the future. I just find it really crazy how three years ago we were talking about this is a move that needs to be done for the, the goodness of college football, how mm. we need to expand the playoff because teams aren't getting in. And yeah, now for it's, the little guy. Yeah, and now yeah. it's completely like, well, we're out of 12-team playoff. Now the big guys are taking over, and it's pretty much just an SEC and Big Ten Invitational. Not that the SEC and the Big Ten aren't the bis- biggest conferences, but it's insane to me how quickly we've gone to this needs to happen to, oh, it's just the SEC strong-arming everybody. I mean, we, we opened the doors to a playoff style to the four. And as soon as it opened to four, the, the smarter heads were like, uh, it ain't done at four. Mm-hmm. It ain't done at four. And we didn't even go to six. <laughs> we didn't even go to eight. We jumped straight to 12. And we didn't even allow ourselves to see what the 12 looks like before they were like, hey, 14. And, and the, the automatic bids, guys, I, I, they talked about it. It's not finalized. They don't know what it's going to look like. But – that's all that's all jargon that's all mumbo jumbo because the only reason they haven't finalized the details on how they're going to go about it is because they haven't finalized the tv contract right they just know they're going to 14 but espn and the rest of the conferences have not exactly established the price point on this 14 team playoff once they do then the sec and the big 10 will be like hey remember when we told y'all we kind of want three automatic bids well y'all gonna give us that right now right and then the other teams obviously as they showed today are going to completely say "Uh uh-huh and then at that point, you have 13 power four and, uh, you know, admittance, right? Six of those will automatically go to the Big Ten and the SEC. And then you'll have one non-power four, you know, mid-major automatic entrant, you would imagine. It won't be, you know, six Big Ten SEC teams and then eight, uh, you know, kind of highest ranked teams. You would imagine they, they get back to the fairness after they give the big boys their deserved shake. And then they'll get to the fairness. Hmm. I mean, honestly, though, like if it, if this continues to go in the trajectory that we think it is, then like it, it's then the, there isn't any of these fairness anymore. It's just going to continue to be like, oh, it, it is just the SEC and the Big Ten battling it out every single year for a national title, because eventually you would think that everybody else around them just becomes a moot point and they're not really even in the conversation they're just kind of seen as a lesser than league or whatever yeah we talked about it last week why even why even create why even go through the hassle of separating football from ncaa and the rest of the college non-revenue sports if you can kind of make the college model your own super league anyways and dictate how things go about Mm -hmm. which is exactly what the uh the big 10 and the sec are doing currently um I'm I'm good with this. I'm I'm fine with this as long as it saves us from whatever a super league feels like. Mm-hmm. I'm I I fear our job and our constituents and our customers ten years from now in a super league being like, well, that Saturday not Sunday league's kind of cool, you know. But mm-hmm. whatever, my my bills get paid off of people who care about the University of Georgia and care about the university that they cheer for and, you know, show up on Saturdays because of the logo and because of the university. I truly believe that that's who pays our bills, who turns these lights on. I don't think it's just because football's great. If it was just because football is great, then guess what? We'd be watching USF football or USL football, or whatever the hell they've rebranded it four times in a row. Okay, we would watch that stuff because it is, there's, there's great football players out there, man. They got highly talented dudes out there, NFL caliber football players that just, you know, as The Rock says, 54th man on the roster. There's not 85 NFL caliber worthy players on the fields on Saturdays, but we watch that and we care about that because there's ties. What happens if we remove those ties? We've talked about this at nauseum at this point, but again, I think if these guys can push their weight around 
I don't fear as much of that being the outcome of this because they're not going to take their ball and ho go home. And by the way, it, it, we're going to welcome you guys into the show here in a second, and we were going to do this afterwards, but I want to do this now because we're already here. Um, if you're the ACC and the Big 12, they didn't just bend, to the, bend the knee to the Kings today. They unanimously voted for this. It was across the board, yay, we're okay with being second-tier citizens. But you have no options. Yeah, I was gonna say, what other choice do you have? Are you gonna fight against the SEC and Big Ten? I mean, what? Where is that gonna get you going against that? Mm, it's, nowhere. it's not gonna get you anywhere. It's gonna get you squashed. And in ten years, the SEC is gonna do their best and probably pry even harder to get Florida State and Clemson and any other team that's worth the salt out of that conference to where you become another Pac-12. Mm. I mean, I think I think people don't really understand that how much of a threat the Big Ten and the SEC are to good teams and other conferences now, just because hey. You want more money? Come over here. We'll do, I mean, that's the entire model of college football right now is where we go wherever you can get more money. We're talking about $100 million over 10 years. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it basically feels like when your parents give you two options and, like, they give you option A and they very clearly tell you this is the correct option. And they say you could choose option B, but also know there's consequences that come if you want to choose that option as well. It's like, well, obviously I have to choose option A because I don't want to be in trouble. Like, you're giving me options, but in reality I don't have an option. Very much. When does I would imagine these TV contracts are the only thing holding these teams to these conferences now, right? The ACC TV contract is holding its member schools. You have to buy your way out of that. Yeah. I, I would imagine we get to a point where those contracts come up and then the Big Ten and the ACC – or the Big Ten and the SEC kind of get the pick of their litter in, in terms of who they want, which makes if, – if I'm a Florida fan, I, I'm not necessarily nervous, but I don't necessarily love the idea that – the ACC is this lesser than program, and there are two like powerhouse historically contextual programs in my state that the SEC would immediately swallow if the ACC dissolved. I mean, what's being stop Florida State and Miami? Yeah, like what's stopping the SEC from two years from now going to Florida State and Clemson saying, "Hey, we just got a shit ton of money from making playoff appearances. We'll pay your buyout to come to the ACC right or to the SEC right now." You don't have to worry about buying out of your contract or things like that. We'll cover that. Like, what's stopping conferences from doing that now? Or better yet, what stops Florida State or Miami from saying doing the SMU stuff? Because now the the money is that drastic, right? The, the the change in money is that drastic. What if Florida State's just like, hey, you don't even have to pay us a TV revenue split. We'll just take the college football playoff money at the end of the year. So we'll forego the forty five million dollars or the fifty five million dollars that you give from ESPN's contract. We'll take the twenty one million that y'all give every school, or that the, we'll we'll take that split of it from the conference at the end of the year, and we'll just survive off that, and, and we'll be fine, you know, because it's enough to 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 not be in the ACC. I, I don't know. We're just we're at, we're at a very as we always come to at the end of these. We're at a very weird spot in college football, mm -hmm. um, and reading this today, I get more sick and tired and impatient with Notre Dame every single time because. I, I hate people who are, I'm better than you and I know it, people. And Notre Dame fighting Irishmen, that's exactly what you feel like to me. Um, obviously, Notre Dame not in a conference, right? But Notre Dame uh, grandfathered into all of this because of historical context and how great they were in the 40s, the 50s, and, and you know, at times in the 80s and 90s. But um, they have gotten grandfathered into this. They will go under the ACC and Big 12 slate of that 38% revenue split. They'll get their $12 million, um, as does every ACC member school. So that's all good news for them. They get to just get grandfathered in, despite the fact that they don't have to actually align to a conference. However, in this agreement today, in this finalization of the 14-team the, uh, playoff, there is a bylaw written in. It says, quote, to help alleviate some of these concerns, sources said a, quote, looking clause for 2028 has been added to give the commissioners and Notre Dame leadership a chance to reevaluate the contractual agreements based on how every league has performed to that point. There also is a clause that permits that timeline to be accelerated if there is a, quote, material realignment. So basically all of these schools decided, hey, no matter what happens, let's make sure Notre Dame is protected and also – Let's give Notre Dame the opportunity to choose whether or not they want to join us or whether or not they want to continue to be this, uh, you know, separate entity that we just accept as being separate. And here's the problem. We're going to get to a point where the Power Four is playing all of their conference games because the SEC's moved to nine, the Big Ten's moved to nine, the ACC's moved to nine. They don't play divisional games anymore. Okay, so their schedules are pretty tight. I don't know if y'all noticed this. And now you got this – 
completely separate entity playing a bunch of Coastal Carolinas, I would imagine, right? They're going to have, like, does USC have all the, the, the scheduling leeway to make sure Notre Dame's on it every year? And does that schedule end up looking like USC, Stanford, and Army and Navy? You know, like, <laughs> what the hell? It basically becomes the inverse of what college football schedules typically look like. Uh, if you typically have – three out of conference maybe cupcake games and then you have the rest of your conference well for Notre Dame it would be we have maybe two or three out of conference games with these powerhouse schools and then the rest of it is exactly what you're saying of Coastal Carolina or anybody else and look historically Notre Dame has always played a tough schedule so I don't want to I don't want to act like this is something that it would it would be very new to Notre Dame but I'm, I'm just here to tell you that as conference games go from eight to nine everywhere we go as divisions get removed and we play tougher schedules across the board, look at Georgia's. Georgia last year had one preseason top 25 opponent on it. This year they got five. Why? Because Texas and Ole Miss are still on the schedule, right? The, 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 the non-divisional games have impacted these schedules to a point where they are much more difficult. And now there is really no incentive to schedule out-of-conference games because there's 14 teams, okay, that are getting into this sucker. So if you're an SEC team, if you're a Big Ten team, all you got to do is be one of the better three teams in your conference. There's no reason to schedule Notre Dame on your schedule, Ohio State. There's no reason for having that on your schedule in moving forward down the line. So I don't see the incentive to keep Notre Dame on the schedule. I don't see the incentive to save Notre Dame. But as the chat and Marion Campbell talks about right here, tradition trumps ability. Tradition trumps ability every single time. And Notre Dame is 100% a traditional powerhouse. And by the way, they don't necessarily need all of this help because they still have their own TV contract with NBC. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like, if anything, this is something that's going to hurt Notre Dame in the long run more than anything. Because the knock on Notre Dame, since I've been alive, is one, they don't play as tough a schedule because they're not in a conference. There's just that aura around them. And two, they don't have the benefit of playing in a conference championship, so you don't have that strength. Like mm. I feel like those two things have never played in Notre Dame's favor, with the exception of 2012, and no one really believed them. I mean, you throw that 2012 team in a the playoff, they're getting smoked immediately. So... I feel like doing this eventually, when you get to 2028, it's gonna, Notre Dame's going to look at it and go like, wow, we really haven't gotten any respect. We really haven't been able to schedule anybody worth the shit, so no one respects our schedule, no one respects our team, and it's hurting our playoff run as, as in a whole. So I just wonder what keeps Notre Dame from being annually 10-2 and two with a, a, a mediocre to above, a slightly above average schedule and being ranked ninth every year. Like, What stops that from happening? I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I guess if, much. if they don't join a conference, then I guess they fall in this qualification of bringing someone outside of the conferences to be in the college football playoff. I mean, I just believe that at some point, as particularly the SEC and the Big Ten become so difficult, so difficult week in and week out with all these really, really good, like real legitimate football teams in it. I just I don't think it's fair is the wrong term. I don't think it's fair for Notre Dame to sit mm -hmm. out. While, you know, Ohio State's got to play Washington, Penn State, uh, Michigan, and USC yeah, but I mean, in, what, in four out of seven weeks. Yeah, but, like, what's the difference between a Notre Dame schedule and a Big 12 schedule at this point? There's no Oklahoma on it. There's no Texas. Yeah. There's no SEC teams. Like, you're going to have Big 12 teams That's in fair. the playoff, too, where you look at it and go, like, they didn't really play anybody. Why are they here? That's fair. That's a good point. I guess in that, in that regard, give them their 52%. That, that's the thing. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, just, maybe that's why they unanimously voted. You're right. You're right, buddy. You're better than us. Yeah, I mean, as messed up as it sounds and as greedy as it is, like, you look at college football and think of think of every team that's been worth a shit within the last 15 years besides Clemson, Florida State, Notre Dame. They're all in the Big Ten. They're all in the SEC now. Like, there's no one there that you can – like, with the exception of maybe Cincinnati on the Cinderella run they had in 2022. Like, other than that, there's nobody. They're all in the Big Ten. They're all in the SEC. Michigan, Washington, Texas, Oklahoma, they're all in the SEC and Big Ten. So it makes sense that 52% of the revenue is going there because 52% of the teams that are being, more than 50% of the teams that are competing for national titles are in those conferences. So, I mean, you've kind of already created the Super League in a way. Yeah. Which, again, I'm good. I'm, I'm good as long as whatever this next iteration is, as long as it holds there and we don't blow the whole thing up. Yeah. I think the idea of blowing the whole thing up sounds – good to uh like two groups of people uh the commissioners and owners of these leagues their tv sponsors and all that good stuff and whatever private equity ends up buying these suckers that sell for 
four billion dollars in 2036 whenever the the rich person gets rid of their rich toy uh, welcome into tonight's show we got a great one for you um a position change for one of the sports best football players has happened this past week i felt uh it was worthy to talk about because we've seen this kind of uh, discussion point pop up on our show quite often of these hybrid six foot three 250 pound humans that are great athletes but maybe not be superior athletes don't really know where to play them uh, you know whether it be Harold Perkins whether it be about this football player we're going to talk about tonight um, there's a, a, a lot of these young men that are playing this game that are having to make this decision we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight um, did South Carolina get enough out of Spencer Rattler um, I'm very curious to hear the gentleman or the 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 guys viewpoint on what they thought of Spencer Rattler's time at South Carolina, what they thought of him as a football player versus what they thought of South Carolina's output from that transfer from Oklahoma, who, you know, by all accounts played really, really well there, but couldn't quite figure out how to win. Um, and then at the end of tonight's national hour, we're going to give you the recipe for a title, what it requires nowadays in a 14 team playoff, what we believe it's going to require to be the last team standing come late January boys. We're going to play college football until damn near February. February this year, so shouts out to that. Um, but first, I want to give a quick shout out to our friends over at Prize Picks, boys. I got an over tonight on James Harden at three and a half points. Three and a half points. Three point one four. Three point one four. National Pie Day. National Pie Day. That's all it was, man. Oh, it's it's going to be, bro. Yeah. That's that's easy. Wow. That's easy. You know, and, and you know, three. I think I got a five x on a three play today over mm. on Prize Picks, and one of them was a straight up gimme. Like, unless James Harden just spends way too much time at the at the strip club tonight and just don't make tip-off. I think it actually hit already from what I saw. How about him? You know, so, prize picks, just giving it away. If you use promo code Brooks today, you'll get 100% deposit match. And what does that mean? What's up? Tomorrow's Flex Friday. And That's, tomorrow's it's a national Flex holiday Friday. every week. Absolutely. It is a national holiday, Flex Friday. Um, so, yeah, prizepicks.com, promo code Brooks. Get in on the action today. Okay, do not wait. Support those who support us. Uh, make sure you hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, and rate, and review. And if you have found us tonight, if for some reason we have popped up on your algorithm, if you have not already subscribed, please feel free to do so. Um, we got a bunch, a bunch of great content coming forward uh, as the spring football sessions heat up, as summer progresses, and of course, as fall arrives. So make sure you hit that thumbs up button, make sure you're subscribing and firing off in that chat today. Uh, boys, Abdul Carter, position change. Do you know who Abdul Carter is? Yeah, he's the uh, Penn State linebacker. Yeah, he's really, really good. Mm -hmm. He's like great, like to the point where I watched him the last couple of years. I'm like, that might be the best linebacker in the sport. Like he is insanely good, insanely athletic. Um, about six three, about 240 pounds, or at least that's what he was playing at in September of last year. Um, he has since ballooned up, which we'll talk about here in a second, but. I thought, again, I thought Abdul Carter was, if not the, one of the best inside linebackers in the sport last year. In the last two seasons, this young man, as a starter, started as a true freshman, has had 104 tackles over the past two seasons, 16 TFLs, 11 sacks, and a pick. Um, he was a, a all-Big Ten first-team player last year at inside linebacker, and now he's moving down to an edge position. Um, and, you know, kind of threw me for a loop today. They're going to pair him with Deny Dennis Sutton, who, for those listening to this channel, might be a familiar name. DDS was a top 100, you know, five st borderline five-star edge rusher out of the DMV area that Georgia was heavy on uh, back in that, I believe, 2022 signing class. Uh, Chop Robinson, their edge rusher, obviously gone off to the NFL, blew up the NFL combine. They need to find some help at that outside linebacker position, that edge rusher position. And they hopefully, or they think Abdul Carter will ultimately be able to fill that void left by Chop Robinson. And I want to read some quotes to you today. Um, and I'm going to read two separate kind of lines. One's a quote, another's a line here from this article. Um, I got the gentleman's name here. This is an article from On3, and I got Jesse Simon Tun. Simon Tun? Simonton? I'd have to see it. it. Simonton. It's spelled Simon Tun. Simonton. Simonton. There you go. Simonton. Simonton. Yeah. We're going to call him Jesse Simonton of On3. Does a lot of writing for On3 over there. Seems to be their news desk. Works his butt off. So we're going to give him some credit tonight. Um, but until I saw this article from today, I, I was about to flame James Franklin based off these quotes right here. Quote, I remember when we recruited Abdul, I thought he was a defensive end. And Abdul and his dad were adamant that he was a linebacker. The reality is that we just wanted him in our program and knew he was going to be a really good player wherever he decided to play. But this wasn't really something for us. 
This was Abdul really wanted to make this move for a number of reasons and we're excited about it. So basically he said Abdul Carter came to him um, and this was something that, you know, James Franklin had kind of put into his ear dating back to high school. And if y'all remember my stance on the Harold Perkins storyline this offseason, it's been about, hey, I admire when coaches forego the Saturday success for the hopes and the dreams and the aspirations of the Sunday player that they have recruited, right? They, they go into these rooms and they're like, I'm going to take care of your son and do everything that I can to over the next three to four years develop him into the man that he's going to need to be to go to the NFL and have a great career, right? So all these dudes do in these rooms and then they get the kid to the, to the program and all they think about is how do I win? How do I win? How do I make sure that my job is safe? How do I make sure that I'm getting a race? How do I make sure that we are winning football games on Saturday and nothing else matters? It's not everybody, but a lot of the times it is. And we applauded Brian Kelly for doing the, this is better for Harold. Harold needs to do this to play on Sundays. Well, when I read that quote, I remember when we recruited, you know, Abdul, I thought he was a defensive end all the time. I'm going to make him a defensive end. That's what I thought. It was like, man, I don't like this. I, I, don't, I don't like this idea that you're taking one of the best inside linebackers in the country, somebody who I thought was one of the best inside linebackers in the country, and moving him down just because of some preconceived notion that you have confirmation bias on until – Jesse Simonton went on in this article and he, he actually brought up Harold Perkins names and said, and yet Carter had a bit of an inconsistent season as a sophomore. Unlike LSU's Harold Perkins, Carter seemed to outgrow the off ball linebacker position. He can, as he continued to fill out his frame, he was actually a more productive linebacker as a freshman. The stats back that out when he weighed 230 pounds, he played last season at 250, and now He's north of that. Boys, this is a guy that can't stop growing. This is a kid who can't stop putting on weight. And if that's the case, we got to move you closer to the football. Hey, James Franklin, you don't get a lot of applause. You really don't. Um, everyone seems to be uh, up against you, especially in the national media and the national limelight. I'm going to give you some credit. This is a tremendous decision for not only this young man, but for uh, Penn State this year as well. Yeah, it certainly seems like it. Um, interesting to have that type of problem where you just continue to outgrow your own position and they have to get kicked inside. So, I mean, it sounds like it's a good problem to have for him because it's going to be productive wherever he plays. And I think he's going to be uber successful at his new position. But, yeah, I had the same feelings when I was reading the article as well of, like, uh, James Franklin's just going to get his way. Like, he ho yeah. hoped it happened. And then he kept reading. I believe at one point it even said that um, he had came to Franklin and said, I want to do this, yeah. and this is, the, this is the decision that I want to make. And I think it's best for both me and the team. So, really cool story to hear. Yeah, looking at my initial reaction was, oh, great, it's another Harold Perkins story where he yeah. has that one position, really succeeds at, and then he moves him somewhere else and hasn't had the same success, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be the case with him. It seems like he's actually – at this point, he's more qualified to play end than he would be an inside linebacker position. I mean, Perkins did the opposite. Perkins was like an edge rusher mm -hmm. in high school, and he was like, you know, I'm never going to be – I'm never going to efficiently carry 245 pounds nope. to be an edge rusher, even though I'm great at this, even though I have great twitch. I'm going to be a six foot two, 230-pound human. So I can't be playing edge. Like, unless I'm going to be Hassan Reddick, there's one of those nowadays, yeah. right? Like, I'm not going to turn into that. I might have aspirations of being Nolan Smith, but – Golly, have you seen Noah Smith play the run? I'm not quite ready to do that. You know what I mean? Like, there, there are certain things that certain body positions can't just they, – they need to make earlier and earlier decisions. And, like, a prime example of this, and this is – we've been talking about this on this channel for a while, how the outside linebacker position has kind of been phased out. You're either a pass rusher or you're an inside off-the-ball linebacker. Like, those mm -hmm. are the only two options nowadays in football because nickel's being played a whole lot more. There's just not three linebackers on the field. Penn State was a little bit different last year. Penn State played a lot of base personnel. They were a 4-3 football team, played three linebackers at the same time. Part of the reason because one of them was this guy. You know what I mean? But now, quick, you read the article, so I, I, I'm pretty sure you saw it. Do you know who Penn State's new defense coordinator is? I haven't read the article. No. Shout out to our boy Tom Allen. Tremendous human, great guy, former head coach of Indiana, is now the defense coordinator at Penn State. They will be going back to a 4-2-5 nickel. So the need for three linebackers just isn't there. One of them needs to come down closer to the ball. Hey, how about this guy that's walking around at like 263 right now because we can't seem to keep weight off of him? Ooh. I would assume that's what he's weighing. I mean, he was playing at 250 last fall, and he's, quote, north of that. Yeah. That boy, 260. You mm -hmm. can go ahead and put it down. Well, especially if you're putting all of your investment out and playing a different position, like you might as well just keep on bulking up a little bit more. Hmm. Tom Allen, defense coordinator. Just keeps coming up. Just, hey, I, good guys don't finish last in the college game. I'm going to tell you that right now. If you are likable, 
if the everyone you've ever worked with is like, you know who's a good guy? That boy Tom Allen. That boy Tom Allen going to have a job forever. <laughs> so, shout out. Um, no, nah, I, I, I applaud coaches who listen to their players. Um, I applaud coaches who put – the longevity and the the prospectual career, not a word, prospectual career of their athletes ahead of Saturday success. If you're a Saturday success guy, you're the equivalent, ooh, I'm going to piss some people off. You're the equivalent of a high school football coach running the triple. You're just doing it because you know you can win with it. You're not doing it to develop your players and have them a better opportunity to play in college. So don't do that. All right. Bad timing. Bad timing for our boy Nick Saban. Did y'all uh, – <laughs> Y'all, y'all saw all the comments, everybody doing the thing. Um, you know, Saban had his soliloquy on Capitol Hill. I believe Barstool Sports put an article out that said, old man Nick Saban bitches, moans, and complains on Capitol Hill for two hours about athletes getting paid. It's not what he did. It's not what he did at all, not in exactly, fact. Nope. Um, but that was everybody, man. That was Everybody wanted to do that one, right? Everybody stood on their social media apps and criticized the messenger instead of listening to the message. Right, I can't tell you how many times yesterday I saw or two days ago I saw on social media something along the lines of, did y'all know Nick Saban just bought a $17 million mansion in Jupiter, Florida? Uh, did y'all know that Nick Saban's made over $70 million in the last 10 years coaching football? Um, did y'all know he's just mad because other teams can do it now and he's been doing it forever? We heard all those criticisms of the messenger completely ignoring the message of how messed up the sport is. It ain't just Nick Saban leaving the sport, guys. It's kind of a bunch of them. Right. And yeah, we uh, we talked about it the other night. We, we can hire new guys to step into that role and take over the job because woe is me. Ain't nobody giving up a, uh, a shit about a guy making 12 million dollars to coach a game. We'll find somebody new. Yeah. And he won't be as good. And that after 10 years kind of matters. Right. That's what's called deterioration and deterioration of your sport is not good. So instead of listening to the message, everybody want to criticize the messenger and the messenger didn't exactly get much help. Because within 24 hours of Nick Saban going on Capitol Hill and being like, yo, ain't no loyalty in this shit no more. Guys don't want to stick around. Everybody wants to know how much money I'm making. Am I going to play? Do I need to get into the portal? Me, 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 me. I came into this shit to develop everything I cared about for 50 years in this sport. Adios, amigos. It's gone. Miss Terry, you know, doing the whole thing. And within 24 hours of my man going out there t- t- talking about loyalty and the sanctity of money, ruining the sport, all this good stuff, uh, our guy Tony Alford just was like, hey, bro, I'm worried about me right now. I'm finna go get this. Uh, and I don't know if you know Tony Alford. Most of our audience probably doesn't. But Tony Alford was the running backs coach at Ohio State, had been for the last couple of years. Um, he, he's leaving Ohio State in the middle of spring practice. Uh, to go take the same job at Michigan, I would assume, for a pay raise. Got to be a pay raise. Yeah, it has to be. I mean, knowing that what he just hauled in at his position for this this next yeah. season, you, you'd have to get a raise to leave that type of – That man could kick his feet up for, for 18 <laughs> weeks yeah. next year. Yeah, so for real. You, yeah, money had to have been some type of objective in that for you to leave a situation like that. I mean – and Ohio State, I mean, as much as they've gained on the roster this year, the coaching staff just continues to kind of take some hits a little bit. And they just feel it feels like they keep on trying to have to figure things out on the fly a little bit. Yeah, and it's weird. I don't know if the loyalty aspect of it is upheld as much as it is in foot, like the players as it is the coaches. Mm-hmm. I mean, coaches move around all the time. We see coaches go to rival schools all the time. It is a bad timing for someone, for the running backs coach of Ohio State to take a job at Michigan immediately after Nick Saban talks about how there is no loyalty in the sport anymore. But I don't know if the loyalty aspects all has ever applied to the coaching position. No. Not, I mean, prior to NIL, I mean – this – and by the way, I, I meant to do this on Twitter, but I didn't want to be the old guy off my lawn thing. This is a millennial thing. This is a my generation thing. I work in sports media. I've worked for the same company for five years. I am an anomaly. I'm an anomaly. Every, every single one of my contemporaries has changed companies. Every single one of my contemporaries has done this. Take it outside of my specter, outside of my, my industry, right? I don't, know if, I, I don't know if it works for you guys at home like this, but – I am 29 years old. I will, t- I will turn 30 this fall. I can't tell you a single one of my friends who has worked at the same company since he got out of school. Can't do it. Yeah. They're all doing this. Everybody's jumping ladders. And they're, they're not trying to climb the ladder. They're saying, ooh, I'm on ladder A, and ladder B fitting to offer me a job up two rungs. I'm going back over to ladder B. And then whenever ladder B tops out, they're like, ooh, I got another two rungs over here. And they jump another ladder. 
That's what everybody's doing nowadays, at least in my age. I don't know. You guys are still in school. You'll find out when you get out of school. But everybody our age is like, no loyalty. Screw that. Spending 40 years at the same company, to hell with that. Climb, climbing the ladder in your own corporation, screw that. Because the odds of it happening nowadays just aren't there for you. Like, you're just not going to do it. Okay? They're, they're probably, by the time you work all those years to do that, they're probably going to hire somebody, you know, younger or mm -hmm. whatever it is in that role. So this idea of people jumping ladders to climb rungs, it ain't nothing new. It's it's going to get worse on the college level, I think, because it's just the nature of who we are as humans nowadays. We want better. We want now. We do not want to be patient. Um, and, by the way, when you're, when you're trying to be patient and trying to be loyal in the college ranks, it doesn't matter if the team goes seven and five and the guy you're loyal to just got fired. That, that's the whole thing about this, right? Guys are leaving, and, and Ohio State's a, a, a terrible example because Ryan Day probably isn't going to get fired anytime soon unless he loses two or three games with this roster they just paid for, right? So, like, the idea that I, I, I can afford to be loyal here is not really afforded to you unless you coach at the University of Georgia or right now, Oregon. Like, if you coach at Oregon, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you can probably ride Dan Lanning. If you coach at Texas, you can probably ride Steve Sarkeesian. If you coach at Georgia, you're probably good. You don't need to really leave there. But everywhere else, the moment you're offered a promotion, you got to go. That's the nature of this business. Yeah, and like I said, I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. And it is, it is bad optics from a fan standpoint when – Oh, our running backs coach just went to the school we hate the most. You know, screw him. But I, I don't think it's that big of a deal. It, it's just the way the business world is nowadays. Like you have to jump ladders to climb rungs. Like that's just the way it is. I think. I just nowadays we get into because everything's coaches versus players now. Even though if you don't want to make it that right, it's coaches get to do this. So how dare you say players should have some type of constraints on them, right? Um, and I understand that. I get that. I just. You know, management always gets afforded opportunities that employment does not. You know right. what I mean? Like, employees don't get to do what management does. Um, however, if management leaves, my contract ought to be up. I think that's how it ought to be. Now, so if I were college football commissioner, day one, here's what I would do. Uh, one, one window, one transfer window, it would probably be in December after National Signing Day. So you have to at least spend a calendar year wherever you go. You know, stick it out, 12 months, worst case. Now, here's how you get out of that. Like, you know, 12 year have to stay there. You know, if your position coach leaves or if your head coach leaves, the guys that you committed to, you get your waiver. You get to go wherever you want, whenever you want. Um, I just think we got we got to put and same thing for coaches. I don't know how we keep them true um, to their contracts, but we don't see it from a head coaching perspective as much as we do from a, a position coaching perspective. The position coaching turnover is, I mean, washing machine style. Most of the head coaching turnover is guy got fired or guy leaving for an obvious better job. There's right. not a lot of wide receiver coach left South Carolina to be wide receivers coach at Georgia mm -hmm. for a $75,000 pay raise. Huh? You know, there's not a lot of that going on in the head coaching world. No. Lateral moves, if you will. Yeah. So it is the position coaches that you got to watch out for. But yeah, nonetheless, bad timing. After we spend all that time being an old man, get off of my lawn and on Capitol Hill, uh, about loyalty and about the, the pursuit of money uh, and greed and all that good stuff. And then one of the most obvious signs of bag chasing from a coach uh, that we've seen in recent memory. I'm curious. Here's the question. Thoughts on Spencer Rattler? Go. I think what he did at South Carolina saved his career, honestly. Future career. Yeah. Pro career. Pro saved his pro career, for sure. What are your thoughts on Spencer Rattler, the football player? On the football player? Just in general. Give me some thoughts on Spencer Rattler. I think you, you could say Spencer, Spencer Rattler has the highest untouched ceiling in this draft class for quarterbacks. I feel like he's still just kind of like – the way I would describe his football career post-Oklahoma is like he had a 40-pound 40 40 dumbbell tied to his ankle and he was trying to swim out of the pool. Like you could only get so far but for the everybody else around you or this dumbbell attached to yourself, which is his offensive unit around him, his offensive line specifically, just keeps dragging you down. Eventually you just got to roll over and die almost. I thought Spencer Rattler played starting NFL caliber worthy football at the quarterback position for like 16 out of the last 18 weeks of his career. Mm -hmm. I thought for like a year and a half, he looked like an NFL quarterback. Um, I thought there were more tight window throws under duress on Spencer Rattler's tape the last two years than any other quarterback in this class. 
Like, you know, Drake May didn't have a lot of protection, but Drake May had a lot of guys running to space for a good portion of his career. Uh, Caleb Williams didn't have a lot of protection every once in a while, but he damn sure had a lot of guys running to space under Lincoln Riley. Um, this dude has been throwing balls into NFL windows under NFL pressure for two straight seasons, and he's done really, really well. Um, he got better. I think there was no doubt about that. Over the last two years, that kid got better at playing the quarterback position while simultaneously everything around him got worse. I mean, way worse. They were uh, 40th in points scored in 2022, got rid of their offensive coordinator. He took a job with uh, Nebraska. And then this past season, they hired Dow Loggins. First year is, is he, under his regime as an offensive coordinator. They finished 77th in points per game. They regressed as a team offensively, defensively, and in the record book. Um, they got worse. He got better. So if I were to ask you, did South Carolina and Shane Beamer make the most out of the Spencer Rattler run in the two years? The answer would be absolutely not. All right. And then you would look at that and you would say, well, who's that on? Who do you blame that on? Do you blame that on the fact that, you know, they had two different offensive coordinators? Do you blame that on the fact that maybe he was just there a little bit too early and the rest of the roster wasn't put together well enough? Or, or maybe they didn't capitalize on his first year success well enough to roll it into year two. Whatever you want to do, um, I put it in one place. And here's, why, here's where I put it. I put it right on Shane Beamer's feet, you know, pun intended. Ah, I see what you did there. I put it right at his feet, and here's why. His bare feet. Okay, and I've talked about this on this show before, and I asked him about this at the SEC Media Days last year. You don't have coordinating background experience. You don't. You don't have offensive coordinating background experience. You don't have defensive coordinating background experience. You are a special teams guy. And that's great. And it's awesome that when I ask you about it, you can stand up there and say, well, I've led the room with the whole team in it. Nobody else has. Coordinators talk to one side of the team. I talk to everybody. That's awesome. It's a great selling pitch. Probably why you do really good in interviews and really good, you know, getting jobs and stuff like that. But the problem is when you have turnover at your offensive coordinator position, there is no one to write that ship. No one at all. You're looking around, and you are dependent upon your hiring practices, which I don't know about you guys, but I got two years of sample size saying Shane Beamer is really bad at hiring people, okay? First offensive coordinator hire last year in 2022, not great. 2023, they regress. He's had three wide receivers coaches in the last six weeks, okay? Turnover at the defensive line room. Turnover at the defensive coordinator position. He's not great at hiring when he has to be great at hiring. That's bad. That's bad. So, no, I, th I think they – I'm not uh, – waste is the word. They wasted two really good years of SEC quarterback play. Is he the biggest example of – in recent memory, at least, of a transfer quarterback not bettering his situation at his next destination? I can't really think of one. While simultaneously playing great? Yeah. Like, it just – like – Everybody else, like when I think of recent transfer quarterbacks, it seemed like that they increased themselves up the pegs a little bit or their team overall did better. Whereas Spencer, like even now, it still feels like he's not getting recognized like he probably should be. And I think it has a reflection on like what happened to South Carolina. But he's really one of these quarterbacks that hit the portal was great. But like it just never felt like anything improved for him. I got one for you. How about Cam Ward at Washington State? Cam Ward transferred into Washington State, spent two years there. Played really, really well. Well enough to be one of the, you know, highly coveted prospects into the portal again this year. And the team just never boosted. They had a, a good little run there. I think they started last year 5-0 and or maybe this year 5-0. and But eventually it all came crumbling around him. I, th I just think it's too, like, I mean, this draft class is littered with them. I mean, Bo Nix is an example of this. Jane Daniels is an example of Penix. this. Michael Penix is an example of this. And yeah, here's Spencer Rattler. And it, it's just interesting to me that South Carolina, like the web, it felt like they had weapons. Like Xavier Leggett, by all means, was a phenomenal college wide receiver. And, uh, Antoine Wells. Antoine Wells. Like they had um, Jefferson. That was He was there as well. Mm -hmm. I can't remember his name. Um, it was just like, I don't know. It just, it was so weird to me how they could never like get anything going offensively. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of transfer quarterbacks that have, haven't gotten in better situations before. I, I think Spencer Rattler is one of them that gets a lot of attention just because it was so highly, high, highly profiled. But I think people forget how low everyone was on Spencer Rattler coming out of that 2021 season. Like he oh, was, yeah. he was booed into being benched for Caleb Williams. Terms uh, cancerous. Yeah, like I mean, he was he was labeled as like Tate Martell 2.0. He walked off point. the field, uh, Oklahoma and Texas, in the middle of the fourth yeah. quarter, didn't he? 
Something like that. I mean, I there, there was there a was lot. Some, some talking point about him being a piss ant during that Caleb Williams stuff. Yeah, there was a lot going on that made him, like, almost untouchable. Like, no one wanted anything to do with him. So, I think what he did at South Carolina was great for him, despite the fact that the team didn't maybe get better. But, I mean, there's a lot of quarterbacks that have gone to different situations and haven't gotten better. JT Daniels did it twice. De'Eric King from Houston to Miami. Like, it happens more than people think. I just think that he was one of the most highly profiled ones because he was such a big name coming in. He was such a big name when he went to South Carolina, and things just kind of were what they were because South Carolina wasn't that great of a team. It is rare, you mentioned, though, where a quarterback plays this well and the team just consistently gets worse. Yeah. It, it's not necessarily concerning, but you wonder, like, if you're playing well and everything else is shit. I, I think primary reason offensively is because they had no run game. Mm -hmm. like they could not run the football the last two years because they did not have an offensive line. Not one. But – if you told me, like, like Jaden Daniels had it really good at LSU. Very good. Really good. Had two first-round wide receivers. Mm -hmm. Had two first-round tackles both years, right? Uh, they were freshmen the first year. The second year, both those tackles are sophomores and really, really great players. The left tackle is probably going to be a first-round draft pick next year. But he had it really, really good. Okay, he's going to go to a shitty situation. There's no doubt about that when he's drafted in the first round. I would feel better – or at least I would know that Spencer Rattler can survive under a shitty situation. Mm -hmm. Spencer Rattler's performance is not impacted by shitty situations. No. We don't know what Jaden Daniels looks like in a shitty situation. Yeah, and I, I honestly think that's why it helped now, him he's out. he's far more talented. You draft him. He's probably going to be a success. I'm just saying. I, I, I use that example because I think Spencer, that is a positive talking point about his NFL future because – Everything doesn't have to be right for him to be good. And that, mm -hmm. that's, that's worth something. Exactly. No, I think, that, again, I think that's why he did so, much, so many favors for him because you were on a bad team and you were the shining light of that bad team. And, I mean, he, I, like, you can argue he went to that bad team because of the way things went prior to him coming to South Carolina. Like, the maturing process that he did from the time he stepped foot on South Carolina to where he is now is incredible. Like, I think that's why South Carolina picked him up because it was, hey, here's this kid with an, an un, un, um, a massive ceiling that mm -hmm. hasn't been tapped yet, kind of labeled as a cancer in the locker room. People might not want a lot to do with him, but we, I mean, we're at a point where we should take him just because mm -hmm. we're South Carolina. We're trying to fight for a spot in the East. And it didn't work out because your team went South, but he still was a very good asset for you. And you have to give Beamer some credit. Cause I mean, he was at Oklahoma during that time. That's mm -hmm. why there was a connection. That's why they brought him over. Um, and he knew, that, you know, Spencer got a bad rap. And now I don't know if he was doing the snake oil salesman stuff in front of the microphone every time, but Shane always spoke highly of, of Spencer as yeah. a human, you know, because, again, it wasn't just the Oklahoma stuff. It was, it was all, let's be honest, it was also the QB1 stuff. QB1 Absolutely. did not out of high school. He was an asshole to his teammates and a straight-up punk. I, I hate using that word, but he was a punk on, on that QB1 stuff. I almost asked him at the combine, you were with me, I almost pulled him off to the side and was like, hey, off the record, if you could go back and just never do that again, what do you think would happen? Like right? he would be viewed totally differently. Absolutely, for sure. He would be viewed as this success story and how he he overcame all these things and and look at him. He didn't give up when he was benched and all this stuff. But because he was an asshole at seventeen, people just assume he's that same person. But I don't think he is. I think he learned a lot. You know, he clearly as has. most of us do. Absolutely. All right, we have a cool little uh, recipe. One of those words I'll never spell correctly. Really? Yeah. It's like, like recipe is uh, one of the easier ones. Restaurant for me is always that. Recipe restaurant for, is very yeah, hard. Yeah, restaurant's impossible. Every time. Uh, recipe, I always want to spell like uh, receipt without the T. Oh, uh, okay. For some reason. Mm. I want to put an I-E in there mm. instead of C-I-P-E. Hmm. It's spelt recipe, pronounced yeah. recipe. Yes, it is. Shout out to the French. The French? I don't know. I don't know. Where's the P? Was that where's Italian? the P? Is that, your, is that your French accent? I just heard, where's the P? <laughs> We're going to a 12-team playoff this year, and it means that the requirements to win that 12-team playoff will probably look, feel, smell, uh, and have a different recipe uh, to success, okay? Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go around the room. We're going to tell the audience what we think it's going to require to win a national title in the 12-team playoff. Do you want me to go first? I have sure, one, two, three, four, five, six categories I think you have to have. Okay. Let's give go. Us, give some. All right. First and foremost, you got to have great quarterback play. Not mediocre quarterback play. I'm talking about great quarterback play. Mm. Guys, when we had four teams, you had to have great quarterback play. 
Now we got 12. So you're not going to be able to have a day or have multiple days where you score 28 points to survive. I don't think that's going to happen in December or January moving forward. You're going to have to have really, really, really good quarterback play. The worst quarterback statistically to win a national title, um, and particularly from a, especially from a pro prospect standpoint over the last five years, was Stetson Bennett. And oh, by the way, all he had was like 17 NFL draft picks on the defensive side of the football. Had about 11 on the offensive side of the football. I think the count's up to 27 now. And they're going to have another 10 this year and have another four or five on that team from next year. So the the amount of talent around that guy was exceptional. And oh, by the way, I think he finished third in the Heisman that year. Fourth, but Fourth. he was there. Okay, so he didn't, you know, he wasn't no slap dick himself. All right, he was pretty good at the quarterback position. Got to have great quarterback play. Um, and this one might be the, the most important of this list after the, after the quarterback play. It's why it's number two. You're going to need to be really, really hot, like really hot towards the end of the season. I'm talking about extreme momentum playing your best football at the end of the year. And in order to do that, you're going to have to be healthy, right? This is a matter of endurance at this point. You're going to have to potentially play 17 football games. Uh, you're you're going to be playing football a long time. You're going to be opening up fall camp middle to late July. You're going to play your first football game end of August. You potentially play your last football game end of January. You know, like uh, three quarters of the year, you're going to be in pads, banging and clanging. This is a endurance test in college football nowadays. And in order to be uh, have the uh, ability to have that endurance, you're going to have to have extreme depth particularly along the lines of scrimmage. It's great that you got seven targets at the wide receiver position. That's awesome. But do you have eight or nine great offensive linemen? Because three of them might roll their ankles some point this season. Do you have six or seven or eight or nine really, really impactful front of line, uh, line of scrimmage defensive players? Are you able to really roll in fresh bodies come November, December, and January in must-win football games? I think that's a key. I don't think you have to have a top 10 defense, but I do think you have to have a top 35 defense. And if you don't have a top 10 defense, you have that top 35 defense, you better have three or four like real difference makers, real playmakers. We talked about it last year. If you just look at the, the history of national championship winners and you take out Michigan this year, you're averaging about three or four first round draft picks on the defensive side of the football. Like you don't have to have 11 dudes but you got to have two or three great ones, all right? And that remains the same here, okay? So even if you don't have a top 10 defense, you better be filled with playmakers, guys that can get a sack on third and eight, guys that can force an interception in the red zone when they're playing bend but break, don't def or, you know, bend but don't break defense. You got to have that. Uh, and then another one right here. You got to have consistently explosive offenses, okay? When we watched the four-team playoff, guys, think about this, right? It was Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards' explosive runs that beat Alabama and Washington, okay? Them being able to get loose for 40, 50 yards really made a difference in that football game. It was Georgia's explosives against Ohio State that kept them and won that football game. It was Arian Smith. It was Kenny McIntosh's 75-yard run that he got tripped up by a ghost. It was all of those runs and plays and explosives, quick hitters that end up being massive chunk plays. That's what won those football games. Georgia's touchdowns to A.D. Mitchell in 2021, those were explosive football plays. The pick six from Keely Ringo, those are explosive football plays Bama and Devontae Smith in 2020 those were not grinded out offenses those were explosive offenses should I keep going I don't think I need to I think you get it in order to win these football games guys you got to be able to score quickly when need be right and be able to put it up and get away from hey grind it out oh methodical offense we got to be able to go right and I think last and most importantly luck's going to play a huge role oh. in what we got going on in these college football playoffs 16 teams all right or 14 teams 12 teams however many we end up going to you're going to have to be really really lucky okay you're going to have to be hot you got to be healthy you got to be lucky mm, damn it i think all six of those are really well i took one of your points and i added another flavor to it for this recipe um but i think not only do you have to have a top 30 defense i said top 30 defense but i think you also have to have a top 15 offense mm. michigan was the exception to this last year they were 14th so they're really not even an exception was that in points scored points scored i i would imagine if you did some metric like yards per play or some efficiency metric they would probably be up there <clears throat> probably so because right? they you know are points per play if you did points per play I bet they'd be up there. Yeah, probably so. But yeah, top fifteen scoring offense of whatever metric you want to see. You got to be one of these high end offenses. However you do it, you got to make the list in both of those categories: top thirty defense, top fifteen offense. I think that also um, 
what did I put right here? Oh, I said that you have to have the ability to adapt because I think that now that you have this expanded playoff, it only opens the door to more variety of opponents that you're going to play. Mm. You know, there are different varieties of football that you play in the SEC, and the Big Ten is the same thing, but they all kind of identify in the same core principles of how you play football in both of those conferences and really in any conference you want to put this on. I think every single conference kind of has their own flavor, their own identity to how they think football should be played across the board and what it requires you to win that conference. That's great and all. You still have to do those things because you need to be at the top in order to be one of these top 12 teams but you also have to be able to adapt to any of these other teams that you could potentially play down the road I mean if you're one of these first round teams you got four rounds that you got to go through and a variety of opponents more than likely that aren't in your conference you have to be able to adapt to those situations and be able to do it on the fly and learn it and how to do it in a week yeah your advanced scouting team has to be elite nowadays man you got to be uh, out here preparing for all of the opportunities and possibilities absolutely and then my last one I think that you have to have three impactful underclassmen on both sides of the football. Hmm. I think that depth is going to play a massive role in this. And so whether it's a sophomore or whether it's a freshman, this also means that you have to recruit at a higher level. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to get these players on the, on the, on not only on your roster, but you need to have them in a position at least halfway through the season to where they can play. They can impact your football team because odds are you're going to have to call on some of these underclassmen at one point. So I think three – I think that's the minimum that it requires for you to be able to have successful, be have success, and be able to do it down the stretch. Historical context is there too as well. There, there's been great freshmen that have impacted national championships. Trevor Lawrence and Justin Ross being one of those. Mm -hmm. But moving forward, as the transfer portal deteriorates depth on rosters, because what you're talking about, like take Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State for examples. It's not their five-star starter that they're worried about being poached off their roster right now, right? It's the four-and-a-half star that is a junior that hasn't cracked the lineup that's getting poached by a, a lesser-than program, right? It's the Jamon Dumas Johnson who doesn't quite fit that mold but just kind of got beat out by C.J. Allen that Kentucky poaches. And now you are deteriorated in upperclassmen, so you are 100% right. It's Justin Williams or it's Chris Cole that's going to have to step in as that third, fourth linebacker at the University of Georgia this year. It's not the reserve linebacker that's been waiting around three years for his shot and his opportunity at most of these programs. So you are right. Not only will injuries uh, decrease the uh, or increase the amount of opportunities for freshmen, but the lack of general depth in older players that has been deteriorated and caused by some of these transfer portals will definitely impact those freshman impacts. Yeah, so you and me had a pretty identical list almost. I said you need to have a top 30 defense. I didn't I didn't say top 35. It has, you have to have a good defense that can have a pulse at times when it needs to be. I said you need to have minimal injuries. Obviously, that one's kind of a given. Injuries can derail anybody's season. I said you had to have a dash of luck. Luck, I mean, name any national champion within the playoff era, and there's been at least one play or one game where at some point they got luck in. If that happened. Bama in 2020 smoked everybody's ass. Nope. That old, they get? that old Miss game, they won by one score. Oh, look that, at that you. was a shootout too. Look at you. Okay, but I mean, so I mean, every team has gotten lucky at some point. Now, other teams have gotten more lucky than others. Like you look at Florida State has gotten the least lucky, and then you go mm. back to obviously Auburn twenty thirteen. Like there's been varying amounts of luck, but you have to have some some semblance of luck. And then for the last one, I varied you from you a little bit. I said you have to have consistently good. Does not have to be great quarterback play, but they have to be able to play in the clutch. I mean, I think J.J. McCarthy is a perfect testament to this. He was clutch when he needed to be against Alabama. He didn't play great. I think he had like 225 passing yards. He was like mm. 17 for 27. Damn near started the game with a pick. Yeah, he completed 10, he completed 10 passes in the national championship game. Mm. It's like you don't have to be like a great quarterback to win national championships for your team, but you have to be consistently good, and you have to be, at play, be able to play in the clutch when you need to. Stetson Bennett is the, the epitome of this. Tua Tagovailoa. Trevor Lawrence, guys like that where it's like when you need to be able to make a play, it doesn't matter what you've done beforehand, make that play now. You have to have a guy that can do that. So you and me are very similar, but that's the one very. It's interesting some of those names you mentioned, right? Like Stetson, Tua, and you said Trevor and J.J. Like from a what God gave you standpoint, Trevor and J.J. are over here. And then from what God gave you standpoint, Tua and Stetson are over here. Mm -hmm. You know, one, two of those guys got really, really elite physical metrics. Mm -hmm. The other two just became really great college football players who are deadly accurate and and just ballers, right? Yeah. Like Tua is a gamer that can't stay healthy. And Stetson has just been a competitor and a guy that just gets the job done during his time as a football player. So mm -hmm. very interesting routes. And, and all four of those guys were like, 
3,600 yards to under 4,000. Like they weren't major. Well, two no. two was over 4,000. Two the other had guys a good. Were not. Two had a really good season in 2018. Yeah, but those other guys were actually. You know what? Managers. No, never mind. Never mind. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Trevor Lawrence game managed the shit out of football games in college. I don't know if anybody ever remembered that. Go look at those stat lines. If I blind resume Trevor Lawrence and Stetson Bennett, every single one of you jokers would be like, damn, I'm taking guy on the left. And then I'd uncover his face like a Scooby-Doo villain. And it'd be, whew, Stetson Bennett, curly hair and all. You looking him up? Yeah, he never had a 4,000-yard season. He didn't. It was like 3,600 yards. Never had, never had, never threw for thirty touchdowns, did he? Uh, yeah, he threw for thirty touchdowns in twenty eighteen and nineteen. Right at it. Well, and if yeah, I mean twenty twenty was a shortened season, so yeah. he would he would have thrown for thirty touchdowns every year. I didn't mean to take a shot at Trevor Lawrence, great football player, NFL top fifteen quarterback right now, great college player. Just I think people misremember his career a little bit. Hmm. You know, they weren't out here putting it up like that. Mm. No, he just looked pretty while they were, you know. Um, are we getting a new employee? Why you ask that? Well, there was this chair, chair right here. Oh, I know you did some cleaning around here, but the there's chair? just this chair. Yeah, you know, may I, I wouldn't say employee, but you know we built this studio for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, one of which just to enhance the general product, make it look a whole hell of a lot cooler. Um, the other. So we could maybe potentially have some guests in here, like really high fluting guests. Um, and you know, because I always feel like Zoom interviews are great. Yeah. Having having Gary come on, having Aaron come on, and have, having Dan come on, like that's great, man. But like, just something about sitting across face to face with a man or a woman and talking some ball, getting to know a little something about them. Um, so yeah, the chairs there because. We, we, we finna pop some shit off up in here. Ooh. Finna pop some shit up off up in here. Um, and, you know, it's hard booking players. Really hard booking players because their schedules are insane. Um, but we got we got some ones coming around here. You know, Stetson last year I think opened some people's eyes. By like, damn, how did he get Stetson? Mm. And then this fall we had Gary. And people were like, well, why is Gary Danielson doing an interview on this Film Got Network place? <laughs> Uh, and then we had Dan Lanning, and people were like, what? <laughs> what? What's going on? Um, I will tell you something. If you are a young content creator, all right, if you really, truly do it the right way, if you work hard, but if you really do it a unique way, and here's my unique way, we talk football. We know football. People who love football, people who play football can come on here and feel as if they can trust the network to talk football. So people are going to come on and do that. That's why the chair's there. Mm. Now, here's what I'm worried about. Some of these dudes that finna sit up in this chair, finna, fake, finna yeah. make your boy look real, real small. How sturdy is that chair? It's, I mean, it's a good bar stool. Mm. Okay, good bar stool. When we had Murray in, in, in the studio, everybody's like, will you get the man a real chair? Um, no, I wanted him uncomfortable. These next couple guests, I want them to feel nice and cozy up here in the studio. I like that. So, yeah, Hell it's yeah. going to be a good run. I hope we can get them all in. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to sit down, talk some ball have a, a conventional interview, and then we're going right over there. We're going oh, right the over board. there. We're going to get up on that board. We're going to watch some football with some Georgia football players. It is Georgia. It mm. is Georgia. We're going to have a bunch of Georgia football players uh, coming through. That's very exciting. And I'm Shooting glad to for know. three, hoping for like six. Oh, I like yeah. it. Wow. That's very exciting. And good to know that my job is not in jeopardy. No, not yet. Okay. You know, n neither is mine, though. I was, I was joking with DJ Shockley the other day. I was like, hey, man. Every time Sam Hartman's football career dies, that's one more microphone that I don't get to talk into. You know, CBS probably already negotiating with <laughs> Sam Hartman's pretty ass. Hmm. Like, boy, you are trash at throwing the football, but God dang, you handsome, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, every time – and, and DJ was like, you know what happened to me? Because DJ's great at his job. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't call games anymore, but when he called games, he was really good. Y'all know how tough I can be yeah. mm -hmm. on play-by-play -play guys and, and color analysts. Um, he was really great at his job. And then this guy by the name of RG3 came in, and he said RG3 is just like swallowed DJ Shockley. It's like DJ Shockley can't get no jobs no more. <laughs> but he ain't hurting. He out here. He out here loving that work for the for the Georgia Network. Hey, mm -hmm. we got a whole nother hour. It's a local hour coming up right now. We got spring intel and practice notes, boys and girls. Oh. 
Welcome to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you took that moment during that second intro for the second hour here to back out of the live chat, hit that thumbs up button. I see over 200 people in here. I don't see that many thumbs ups. So I'm asking you right now, please support the channel uh, just by a quick thumbs up. Um, For those of you who don't know, we do our local hour in the second hour of our two-hour show every single Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. We got pro day reactions. Uh, I took a video or took video of every single throw Gunnar Stockton threw at pro day yesterday. We're going to watch that and break that down um, and be as honest and as truthful as we can without having you guys freak out about a four minute clip that doesn't really mean much, but we still need to coach it uh, or at least talk about it today. So we will. We have a player of the day as well for you. But first and foremost, I want to talk about these practice notes because for the first time all spring, And I would assume we could count them on one hand how many times we're going to get to go out there and watch practice. But, you know, most of the time we're digging through sources. I'm sending text messages out, calling folks, bothering people. Hey, what'd you see? Hey, now practice go today. What the guys look like? Yada, 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 yada. We didn't have to do that today. Today we got 15 minutes, a glorious 15 minutes, to go out there, walk through or, you know, go through practice, stand on the sideline, take a few photos, uh, and get our own observations. So I have a plethora of notes to go through for you guys today. We will start as we always do on the offensive side of the football with the quarterback rotation. It was as expected. Carson Beck taking the first reps, Gunnar Stockton right behind him with Ryan Puglisi. And and here's what I want to tell you about the uh, quarterback room, okay? Gunnar has done everything to be the guy at the number two spot and will continue to be the guy at the number two spot and will start the spring with whatever head start he can hold on to on Ryan Puglisi. That is the way I believe this will operate. Now, I want to tell you about Ryan Puglisi because as I've always said on this channel, if you've listened to it for long enough, um, which I'm going to stop saying, I'm just going to assume every single one of you has been here forever. So, as I've always said on this channel, the, the intel is always good and it's never bad. And what do I mean by that? If I'm hearing anything about you as a young player, it's because you're doing great, and they know already that you're going to be something. They have a firm belief that we can allow hype to be built around this guy, and we can let this out. If I don't hear anything about you, if there's never a word said about anything that you're doing in practice, I can assume, based off doing this for four, going on five years, it ain't going well. Okay, if I don't even hear it like an inkling, like, hey, Buddy's getting it. It's clicking for Buddy. Then, 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 buddy, you are not going to survive. You're going to be in and out of that program really, really quickly. Guys, it took like three practices before word about Ryan Puglisi started to rumble. My God. Oh, my God. Look at these throws. We played a clip about a month and a half back of uh, Warren Brinson talking about him on the Players' Lounge. Boys and girls, Georgia, I don't know if he's a gamer. I don't know. We're going to see what it looks like on Saturday. But they think they have one in Ryan Puglisi. They think whenever he gets onto the field – he going to be something. So that that is good news uh, for the quarterback room. And, again, it's it's all practice, right? It doesn't mean anything. But the combination of he has all the physical traits, the combination of he's doing it in practice now, and, oh, by the way, one of the – when it comes to does this guy seek competition, which is one of the biggest intangible traits at the quarterback position, I mean, you don't even check it. You color the whole box in solid black ink with Ryan Puglisi. The dude seeks competition. He searches it out. So, as I had a source tell me yesterday, nine times out of ten, if you seek competition, you tend to be a gamer because you're always competing, right? You know what I mean? Like, if you're one of these guys, you tend to do that kind of action. What's up with the AirPod? What you got going on? I'm checking the audio. Keep going. Oh, okay. No doubt. That's a, that's a good little production note right there from the Brody. Is the chat talking about it or something? Yeah, people say you're quiet again, but, I mean, it's fine on my end, so we'll see. Bump her touch up no knobs. Yeah, Everything's yeah. been the same. I, I guess go ahead and give her a, a, a nod. But, I mean, dude, shit. I, I redline it. I listen back to it. And when I get muffled on you, I don't like that. I don't like that at all when these really expensive microphones redline. We already have 
uh, audio technicians DMing us and all that stuff. I, I got plenty of people helping us, um, but somehow we keep effing stuff up. So I don't, it's fine every time I listen to it, even when I'm whispering like this. Because sometimes I'll be saying sneaky stuff that I don't want to scream. I just, yeah, whatever. Quarterback room. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. You need a fourth body. Julian Lewis was there today watching practice. Uh, I got a Kirby microphone moment for you guys later on that one. Yes. Um, one of my favorite Kirbyisms I've heard on a microphone came out today uh, talking about Ooh. recruits, actually. So we'll oh. talk about that a little bit later. Matter of fact, I'm going to do it right now. Kirby always on the microphone, always hilarious, always on his shit, always jumping down somebody's throat. Today, the first thing I heard him say on the microphone, I'm not going to mention the player's name, even though I already did it in Discord. He walks over to him, clearly. I'm off the I'm, I'm behind the, the wall, so I can't see what's happening, but I can hear what's happening. And he walks over and he goes, hey. And he says the player's name. And he goes, how many games did you start last year? <laughs> and you can hear the player go, none, sir. And he goes, you're GD right. Now, why don't you practice like it? Mm. I was like, ooh. Ooh, but I mean, bro, for, for flex, they ain't even put the helmets on yet, run out on the field, <laughs> and he's already shitting on somebody. And then I heard this one today, right? They got prospects there at practice today. Mm -hmm. And Kirby, in the middle of screaming at whatever DB it was that wasn't taking the right steps, he must have looked over to the sideline and saw a prospect on his phone, and he said on the loudspeaker, if you're a prospect on your phone right now, all you're doing is telling me you don't give a shit about my practice. cold come on baby that's cold that's that one right there that's, that's that one right there that, that's a great reminder of like not only is kirby recruiting kids to join his program but kids are recruiting themselves to be accepted into those programs it's not just a one-way street where it's just the coaches coming after the players i mean you got to do your part as a prospect too to continue to look i, I mean worth a take i mean at a program you got to keep everything good between you and coach yeah i mean i i think that that's probably one of the reasons why so many people respect Kirby Smart, not only as a coach, but as a recruiter, because he's not someone where it's going to be like, oh, you know, you're this high and mighty five-star recruit. We can't do anything to piss you off. Like, if you're on your phone, I'm going to call you out. Like, I don't give a shit if you're a five-star. Oh. And I don't know who the prospect was, but. I know my stomach would have fell to my feet if I was that person. If you were that guy. Oh, yeah. I'd just drop my phone and be like, it <laughs> 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 me, bro. Um, I, one thing I've always said about him and one thing I've always heard that's, you know, anybody in the building will attest to this. It's top to bottom, all gas, anyone can get the smoke, no matter what. So if it's the damn assistant that is at the front desk that doesn't have the right juice that morning or whatever, has a, a pouty look on her face, whoever, she can get it. You know what I mean? Like she, she can get a screaming too. And then you go down the hallway, and he's now all of a sudden he's shitting down the throat of uh, Stacy Searles. And then he goes down the hallway, and he's and he's correcting you know Sinclair, right? Whatever it is, man, he's just like always on go, always on site with everybody. And one thing I I would imagine he's probably always right. Yeah, like that's got to be really frustrating too. Like I, I I'm not a coach, but sometimes I get into coaching situations, and you're so quick to correct. And then you correct something, and the player looks at you and says, well, I did it because this guy said to do it that way. And all of a sudden, now as a coach, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. I highly, highly, highly doubt that ever happens to Kirby. If Kirby <laughs> corrects you, he's probably right. Mm -hmm. um, but nah, the, 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 the Kirbyisms on the microphone are elite. Back to the, the practice notes here. Running back rotation is very interesting, right? When they're doing quarterback center exchange or, or, or quarterback running back exchange where they're taking snaps and handle balls off, Trevor Etienne was working with Carson Beck. You would assume that's to build rapport, right? But then when you go over and after that, it's Trevor Etienne, and then it's Roger Robinson, and then it was Andrew Paul, and then it was Chauncey Bowens, and then it was Cash Jones. But then you go over to individual periods, right, where they're just working with their position coach, Josh Crawford, and now Cash Jones is in front of the line, and behind him is Roger Robinson, and then by him is Chauncey Bowens, and then boom, 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 and then at the very end, was Trevor Etienne. And, and here's my thought process behind this. What we do during good on good or what we do when the ones are actually taking reps is important for rotational purposes. What we do during individual time period kind of lets me know what the room thinks of the room and, and like who we look to to be an example. Okay, so like when we go to indie periods, my old head who's never going to F up ought to be up front, you know, or whatever, you know, leader or whatever, you know, first team guy. Ought to be up there. So you see Cash Jones up there, 
Guy's not going to F up during practice. Also, by the way, we got a new position coach. Mm -hmm. So we might want to make sure the old head's up front not messing up um, or at least giving us some continuity. And then the guy who right now needs a lot of coaching, put him at the back because he's very new to our system, very new to everything that we got going on. Um, and you could also tell during practice today that Etienne's getting a lot of extra, extra coaching. You know what I mean? He's getting a lot of extra uh, talkings to uh, during in-between reps and good stuff like that. Other thing I will say, and it's a big room, right? Rod's huge. Andrew Paul's a big guy. He's 220-plus. Um, Chauncey Bowen's not little. Trevor Etienne's noticeably more compact. I'm not going to say small, but he's he's quaint. You know? He's not a big guy. Like a Dejon Edwards type? or even? Very much so. But doesn't have – Dejon's very edgy. Knees are very pointy. <laughs> You know what I mean? Bow-legged to an extent. Etienne is proportional mm. across the, the frame. I also think Etienne looks like he's heavier, even though he's probably not. Mm. Dejan walks around at 205, looks a buck 85. Mm -hmm. I think Etienne walks around at 195 and looks 205. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. All right, on to the O-line rotation. This was, you know, guys, I, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, I think the running back room or the offensive line room is done. Now, how, how, how they go about rotating, they'll figure that out. But in terms of, like, I go into spring and into fall camp looking for my eight or nine guys I'm going to travel with, you got them. Ernest Green at left tackle, Dylan Fairchild at left guard, Jared Wilson at center, Tate Rattledge at right guard, Xavier Truss at right tackle. That was the ones unit with Micah Morris rotating in at both guard spot today. Um, and then after that, you're looking at Jamal Merriweather at left tackle with the twos, Monroe Freeling at right tackle with the twos, Daniel Calhoun at one of the guard spots with the twos. There's your eight. There's yeah. your nine. Yeah. You're, you're done. Okay. I, I, I hate it for our guy, Kelton Smith. I hate it for uh, Bo Hewley, who's out this spring. I hate it for uh, some of these young guys that uh, you're just not traveling this year. I'm sorry. You're going to get to dress for home games. But the, the eight or nine, the bus route is done. Mm -hmm. The the bus rotation is is over with. They already know who they're did, going Did this you have fall Drew Bobo with. on that list? Drew Bobo, I don't think, travels this year. Really? I don't. Th <clears throat> and here's why. They're going to have all these backup centers. Mm -hmm. Okay. All these guys are going to rotate. All these guys are going to play this spring and figure out how to go into the fall to where Daniel Calhoun travels and Mike or Drew Bobo does not. Okay. Like, come on. Can we explain that one? Like, try, try to walk into Kirby's room, office and say, hey, we're not going to travel Daniel Calhoun. Huh? No, yeah. I mean, it makes, it makes sense to yeah. me. I'm just thinking from a standpoint of you always want to be too deep at a position. Now, so. maybe they traveled not – like, last year they traveled the office line room heavy because of this. Yeah. And Drew Bobo was not ready. They traveled Austin Blaschke. You know what I mean? And he still didn't really get into the lineup. Right. He was kind of their swing player last year. But, no, I, I, I don't know if if it were my room, if I only had eight and the ninth was Bobo, we're traveling light in the center room and somebody can figure it out when all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, that handles the O-line rotation. Again, I think it's finito. I think Stacy Searle's got the easiest job of everybody this spring. It's, hey, let's make sure Jerry Wilson gets as many reps mentally – as he possibly can, physically as well. Let's get him used to it. But mentally is more important. Make sure he knows all of his mic IDs and all of his protections and, and all that good stuff. Um, and then after that, let's keep developing these young cats. Um, so, yeah, there is that. Let's go on to the wide receiver rotation. Uh, Colby Young got listed at 6'3". That's horseshit. Hmm. That's the biggest 6'3 I've ever seen in my life. Colby Young is – if Colby Young 6'3", then I am 5'9". Okay, like it just – that's a six-foot-five human being. And he's wearing nine, so I almost wanted to say, oh, he kind of looks like Justin Robinson. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't because he's like – he looked real thin in a Miami uniform. He does not in a Georgia uniform. Mm -mm. You think he he's put on weight big. maybe or is it just he's always – No, he's like put him. on weight. He has significantly put on weight since – I'll be honest. The last time I watched Kobe Young on a football field was that Miami Texas A&M game, which I think was in September. Yeah, yeah. early, it was very it's early like week on two, in the season. I think. And he had a buck eighty, and I was like, "Ooh, I want me some of that." And uh, here he is in Athens, and he looks every bit of that. Um, let's see here. He, he still moves really well despite not being a hundred percent. Dylan Bell, Ra Ra Thomas, and Dom Lovick seem to be your alphas here, guys. Seem to be kind of leading this room quietly. Makes sense. None of those guys are extroverts. All those guys very introverted. Mm -hmm. Going to just go about their business and get after it. Um, James Cole. James Coley. James Coley is the most animated football coach I think I've seen on a Georgia football field, dude. 
like MF and this, GD and that, Ooh. screaming, hollering. Really? Oh, dude, in everybody's ass. That's interesting because every- in everyone's ass. Hmm. Why is that interesting? Didn't check that. Well, just every time I've seen him in person, cool, or, calm, and collected, yeah, just quiet. very, very like mild mannered. Uh-uh. And I think now we're understanding maybe why Kirby Smart wanted him back mm-hmm. on staff. So they were doing this drill where, you know, we run up ten yards and we break either right or left at the cone. You know, a little T drill, okay, a little T drill uh, with the corner in trail position, okay. So. Okay. We're gonna get we're gonna get on top of the corner and then we're gonna force the corner to react to us going left or right. But we gotta get to the cone. Gotta get to the cone. The first guy oh. runs the cone short. Get to the get cone. Second guy cuts the cone short. Blow blow the whole drill up. Blow the whole drill up. Walk down. MF G D. Do your shit right. Get back on the line. Start it over. It was not. It was not a casual approach no. today from James Coley. And again, no, like on camera and like when he's interviewing people, not like that. Mm-mm. Man, you always knew like if you're running suicides, if one guy didn't touch the line, then you're like, okay, we, that was our one mistake. But man, if the second guy didn't touch the line, you knew you were in you were in deep crap after that. Not the most interesting thing I saw from a football coach at the University of Georgia today. We will get to that in our give them three a little bit later. Oh, Ooh. Yeah, bro, I'm gonna. I feel like you know. I feel like I know who it is. Yeah. Yeah, we'll give it to you later Uh, for the chat. Stick around for this. A Georgia football coach was out at practice today in full cleats and a helmet on taking indie drills. If you want to take your guess in the chat of who it might have been, feel free to do so. (laughs) It was interesting to see. See, nonetheless, Um, tight end rotations as expected. Pretty boring room for them this spring. It all depends on just how good Jaden Riddell is going to ultimately be. Um, Jaden Riddell, very similar to Ryan Puglisi in the sense that didn't take long. Started hearing about Ryan or uh, Jaden Riddell in uh, the bowl game practices. Mm -hmm. Just A, how big he was, but B, damn, he's fast. Like, holy hell, guy runs by folks already over 22 miles per hour in the workouts um, up there at the University of Georgia. So he is rolling. NFL scouts I talked to are already well aware of who this individual is before he's even played a single down in college. Um, he's going to be one of those ones. Lawson Lucky's had a great spring. He's tough as shit, man. Every every coach and every source I talk to just raves about, you know who they compare him to? Hmm. And ironically, apparently him and this guy get into a lot of fights during practice. They compare him to the, – he's the tight end version of Chaz Chambliss. They say this guy oh. practices extremely hard. This guy don't take no shit off nobody. All of his teammates respect him. They don't want no shit from him. Yeah. Gets a, a, an offensive version of, of Chaz Chambers is the comp there from a lot of people that I talk to inside the building. But it's a, a really thin room right now. Okay, you got two scholarship guys waiting on your sec to get there. Um, and then outside of that, you know, it's walk-ons. Mm-hmm, well, right. three scholarship guys, excuse me. Heinrich, four. Heinrich's there now. Yeah. Two. So you got four. Three practicing. Right. A fourth coming this summer. Mm-hmm. Still a thin room nonetheless with the loss of Pierce Sperling. All right, any questions before we go to the defensive side of the football, boys? No. No, I mean, you covered it pretty detailed. All right, let's go on to the defensive side of the ball. Defensive line. All right, this is – I'm a big proponent of watching indies, okay? And, and it's all they give us. But I'm a big proponent of watching the rotations during Indy too because I do think you can pick up on stuff because at least – Kirby, you played it. I ain't never seen a backup's backup take the first reps in Indy, have you? Never. Never. And when I was in college, it was first unit up, second unit up, third unit up through the whole drills. And it's been like that at every university I've ever been at because why wouldn't it be? Um, but I, I watched these things, and it was interesting today to watch when the first group of interior defense alignment, you know, the nose tackles and the D tackles, not the edge rushers, not the defensive ends, not the jacks. I'm talking about those two inside guys. When they popped out as a pair at first, it was Nas Stackhouse and Jordan Hall. Hmm. And then huh. the second group was Ja Jarrett and Warren Brinson. Interesting. Just something to note. I would imagine Jordan Hall and Warren Brinson are pretty interchangeable. I would not expect that to be the case with Nas and Ja, but perhaps it is. But that was kind of the the one-two punch. And I think they – honestly, they pair really well. You know, Nas is the more athletic, and you pair him with the, I would say, more disruptive but less athletic Jordan Hall in comparison to Warren Brinson. And you pair the bigger, more physical nose tackle and Ja with the more athletic – defensive tackle in Warren Brinson it I, at this position defensive tackle and nose tackle more than more so than ever the last couple of years who starts doesn't matter 
Yeah. It's who it's who's hot and who's winning reps midway through the season. Um, so that's kind of the defensive line notes. Um, Michael Williams and Joseph Jonah and Jonier today in the 15 minutes we were there rotated between both individual groups with the interior and, and edge defensive ends, okay, and the edge guys, the Jacks. Okay, started over there with Uzo, and then Uzo was like, what are y'all doing over here? Y'all ain't supposed to be – I don't got y'all until period seven. Get over there. And then they ran over there to the defense line. So, um, a little more colorful language, but everyone's yeah. been there. Guys that play multiple positions, their position coaches got it written on the sheet. Uh, <coughs> it'll say, like, 13 and 99, and it'll have the, the practice periods that they're supposed to be over there. So, they're practicing with two groups. You should know that. That's the point of me telling you that. Um, Chaz Chambliss, Gabe Harris, Sam and Pimba, and Damon Wilson make for an extremely explosive group. Mm. I know everyone's got their thoughts about Chaz Chambliss, but you know Gabe Harris, Sam and Pimba, and Damon Wilson are freaks. Like all three of them, for a variety of different reasons. I would say Mpemba is the more well-rounded, like athlete. He can do just about everything in a more Chaz Chambliss-esque frame. Looks like a black Chaz Chambliss that's an inch taller. Mm. It's exactly what he looks like physically. Um, and then there's Damon, who's like 6'5", long, lanky, twitch. Just whoo, you know what I mean? And then there's Gabe, who's 6'5", 245, disruptive. Just does all the blowing of the play up uh, as a football player. So, very diverse group right there, just in terms of like size, ability. And I, I think they're all going to get dispersion of reps. Like, I don't think there's going to be any one rep hound in that group. I think they're going to play a bunch of those guys. Um, on to the inside linebackers. Boy. I have not, I have not seen freshmen that what you look across the field and you're like, hey coach, who in the hell is who in the hell is 18 and who is 16? And it's a group that's got, I don't know, three other NFL football players in it. Mm -hmm. Right? CJ Allen, mm -hmm. Raylan Wilson, uh smiles not in pads this this spring, but Jalen Walker standing over there. And I, I'm I'm more <laughs> I'm busier watching the damn eighteen year olds over there. <laughs> Than I was the guys who've been there three years. Those two humans, they are quite. I have the audio notes because they don't let us take video. Mm -hmm. The KJ Bolden audio that we're going to get to in a second is hysterical. The, the, I just ran across those two avatars standing across the field. I think at one point I said, Who the is 16? Who the is 19? And then I realized I said, Oh my God, those are the freshmen. And the audio is, those are the two most Quay Walker in this looking mother I've ever seen. <laughs> like they look like Quay Walker. It's nuts. Um, and they're true freshmen. They're they're gonna be really, really good football players. Jalen Walker spent most of his time during Indies over there with the inside linebackers. He knows how to rush the passer. He needs to learn how to read keys and get downhill. That's that and, and turn and run as well. Um, so that, that that handles that. Now, one of the positions I was most intrigued about was obviously the star position. Right. Not who's starting, but what's the what's the rotation? And I don't know if anybody else – I don't read other practice notes. I don't read anything. We have too much content to be out here reading other people's shit in our space. Um, but I, I know how I picked up the star rotation, and I think you kind of had to know football to pick it up because they were running something called a starburst, uh, you know, kind of alignment, which is where the scout team stacks. And if you know anything about Georgia's defense, who's the point man against a stack? Do you know? It's a top guy, isn't it? No, I'm talking about the guy who walks closest down to the line of scrimmage and puts his face into the face of the point man. Oh, the point man like on defense? Yeah. It's a star. It's a star. So, you know this. I know this. I don't know how many people know this, except for if they were just watch. oh, Jonell, he must be playing star. But the point man is always a star in Georgia's defense. The, the corner stands outright with his butt to the sideline, and the safety stands over the top uh, with his shoulder square against these types of formations. It was Jonell Aguero – with Dalen Everett and Dan Jackson, okay? And then on the other side of the field, it was Kyron Jones playing star with Julian Humphrey and David Daniel Sissavon. Hmm. And then when the ones came back up on the left side again, Jonell took the reps, um, and then, you know, Dalen again, and then Dan Jackson again. And then on the other side, it was uh, Ja'Cory Thomas hmm. getting reps at star, with Jake Pope behind him. I was going to say. Okay, with Jake Pope behind him and uh, <clears throat> Daniel Harris at the corner as well. So, from my understanding, it goes Joan El Aguero, Kyron Jones, Ja'Cory Thomas. Ja'Cory Thomas, obviously noticeably uncomfortable, looking like he was learning, absorbing a new position, or at least absorbing something that he hadn't been doing a lot of. 
And then um, the other thing that I noticed about the safeties group is, holy shit, K.J. Bolden. Oh, my God. This is a guy I've seen a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of. And you never really know how big they feel, look, or, like, are until they get to Georgia and they stand around other big, tall, long, fast guys. Should I play it? Play it. Why not? All right. So, this is me. They don't allow you to video at the University of Georgia. This is me walking down the sideline and multiple times trying to figure out who the hell is number four. And if y'all know me, you know that I talk about football players a little bit suspectly. Let's just call it what oh, it is. Oh, yeah. Okay. My adjective usage is that of somebody who finds a woman attractive. And I apologize for that. Here we go. Number four. Oh, that's KJ. Oh my God. He looks gorgeous. It ain't hard to spot the five stars, even if you don't know their numbers. I mean, he's standing there. First of all, pause. Second of all, he's standing there with guys like uh, Justin Rett. Guys like David Dana Sisavon, guys like Dan Jackson. These are not small humans. No. You know what I mean? These are not small humans. And the it's palpable. Who who is that? Who is that? I said the same thing last year when I saw Julian Humphrey. I saw the same thing last year when I saw Daniel Harris. I said the same thing last year when I saw Smile Mondon, you know, coming back from a, a kind of a foot injury into the fall, fall camp. You're like, God dang, he looks great. Um, same thing here, man. It was noticeable. And again, that's a guy I've seen a bunch a bunch during his high school career uh, and noticeably bigger. You know, he's put on some weight uh, and still moves tremendously. So, yeah, five stars stick out like sore thumbs, even at Georgia. Mm. Good to know. It's not hard to tell sometimes. No. Wife scouts, right? Your wife ought to be able to go out there and say, hey, that's the one. Mm -hmm. Who is number four? Four is a good number for him, I think. Yeah. It doesn't look as good on him as three does on C.J. Allen. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Man. Man. Switched? oh yeah. yeah, buddy. Oh, yeah, buddy. And it's so crazy to look over there and see some of them avatar that they got playing linebacker and then being like, hey, who's the best one? Three. Three. <laughs> Three. The one who looks nothing like the rest of them. Three. He's the best one by far, and he will be. That, that guy, man, he's going to be so good this year. Mm. So it's going to be fun to watch. Um, we already hit the corner, uh, kind of, to an extent. It's Dalen, and then it's Julian, and it's Daniel. I don't think there's an, a fourth, really. It's Ellis. Ellis will be the fourth, but it's a three-man race for two spots. Is what it you looks like. You don't think there. Ellis can get his wedge his way in there, dude? I, I think they spent so much uh, time, effort, and probably let's be honest about the state of college football money retaining Daniel Harris and retaining Julian Humphrey this off season that in classic Kirby Smart fashion. He is going to make that old guy lose that job. The, a yeah. young, the young cat never wins the job at Georgia. The old guy loses it yeah. every single time. So somebody's going to have to lose that job before Ellis gets in there. <clears throat> That's nope. fair. All right, where are we going next? I want to guess on who this play. First of all, describe what you saw at the practice that was oh, so here interesting. We go. All right, so here we go. All right, we're going through indie practices, right, individual periods. All the players are with their position coaches. Okay, Kirby's walking around surveying. Motherfucking everybody on the microphone. Good. Okay. And then off into the distant distance, I see this gentleman who is obviously not a player. He's got the mold of a, a, a not a player. And he's not moving like a Georgia player, but he's moving. And he's got long sleeve shirt on. He's got long black pants on. And he's got like bright red cleats on. <laughs> bright red cleats. And the some bitch got a helmet on his head. With a visor. And he's over there doing drills during individual periods. Did he have a guardian on? No. But oh. he had a visor on the helmet, like complete, ga like game ready, chin strap buckled. And I'm like, what the? Who is this? Who is man's over here getting some rehab work? Like, what safety is or what DB is hurt? Oh, I just gave some of it away. What DB is hurt out here? Why is man's out here taking reps in street clothes? And then man took his helmet off. I said, that's a goddamn coach. That's a coach out there taking full-ass reps like he's in his glory days. I didn't know. I didn't know. Catching balls? Doing everything. I'm like, what is going on? Any guesses on who it is? You're, it's down to two. 
Yeah, my first guess was going to be Uzo. No. But it's Dante Williams then. It is. It's mm. Dante Williams. Dante Williams had game issue cleats on. I'm surprised he didn't have damn gloves on, to be honest with you. It's the only <laughs> thing he was missing. Gloves, shoulder pads, and pants. He strikes as one of those old school guys who's like, we don't wear gloves. I was waiting for him to throw the helmet down, look at somebody and go, that's how it's fucking done. You know? Do one of those. Like, why? I, I'm, I'm so and so years old. I'm oh, a washed up has been. Gosh. I can do it. Why can't you? I love those coaches. I am one of those coaches, by the way. When I'm working out young quarterbacks and they can't make a throw, and I haven't thrown in like 50 minutes to an hour since warm up, and I'll just grab it. Come on, man. Man, we had I had a basketball coach, and every so often he would be wearing his his signature, or I, they were just his basketball shoes, or he'd tell a player like, "Hey, go get my basketball shoes out of my <laughs> office right now." It's like, oh, shit, and like here we go again, and he would let you hear it every single time. I mean, it was just golly. We had a coach that would go through, and you you would if you did it wrong, you'd have to hold the play sheet because he always kept it in his back pocket, so he could go through and do the drill. So that started becoming a joke. It's like, oh, you're about to get, you're about to hold the play sheet. I had a uh, a middle school football coach. To this day, the hardest football coach I've ever played for, and from a conditioning standpoint, I knew bear crawls ad nauseum. Oh my god! But his name is Coach Locker, Wayne Locker, and it was spelled L O U G H E R, Locker, but it was spelled Locker or pronounced Locker. Um, and Coach Locker was the scout team quarterback on our middle school football team. And it didn't matter. There was no tagging off on, on Coach Locker. <laughs> Coach Locker. Coach Locker would get mad if you didn't tag off on him while simultaneously hitting you with the just meanest stiff arm oh, to the face man. mask possible. Coach Locker was definitely out here living out his version <laughs> of playing quarterback. And by God, I promise you right now, in front of Mama, uh, you know, my wife's basement, in front of God and everybody, if I'm ever in the position as a head coach or an offensive coordinator, you bet your ass I'm playing scout team quarterback. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, you ain't going to be able to touch me, and I ain't never down. <laughs> I ain't never down. But, yeah. Where were we at? Just talking about old talking coaches. About your, what you saw at Oh, practice. Dante Williams being, yeah. a, being a, a guy out here. Helmet and all. I can't wait. Can't wait to see him out there in gloves in practice. Mm. I almost took a picture of him. Like, new five-star. Unnamed. <laughs> unnumbered um should we get to this gunner video i think we should get to the gunner video all right now i ain't gonna lie to you folks um i con i honestly contemplated whether or not we were gonna do this because i know how these things work i just spent about 10 minutes to start the show on the local hour telling you that ryan puglisi has already done some really impressive stuff at the university of georgia that ryan puglisi already has everybody kind of raving about him um and then I'm going to follow that up with not the best. This is not the best showing. I've seen Gunnar Stockton throw the football since he was 16, 17 years old. This is not uh, normally what we see of him. And what I'm going to say up front is I think this has a really, really easy answer as to why this looks the way it does. Because it doesn't look great. I'm going to be honest with you. My only answer and the only thought process I have is that the cat has not thrown a bunch of NFL footballs. And that sounds goofy, and it sounds like a simple excuse. And anybody who hears that and immediately thinks I'm making excuses has not thrown an NFL football. It is rounder. It's not bigger. It's rounder. It's thicker. Your hands have to be bigger. The, the laces feel different on them. They're not as risen. They're much more flat. Um, you have to cut this ball. You can't, th you can't rip down on this football. you got to get it from the side. You can't pull it from the top. And at any point, with a Wilson or a Nike ball – or a college ball or a high school ball, if the ball gets wobbly, if I've got enough arm strength, I can drive through a wobbly ball. Throwing a spiral is, is ancillary. It doesn't matter with a high school football if you've got enough arm strength. But when you get an NFL football in your hand, the moment that ball gets loose, the moment we are not throwing a tight spiral, that thing flails like a goddamn duck that's been shot. Okay, so that's what you're going to see to an extent here. And that's what I'm going to tell you is the reason some of this ball placement is just not great. Because it's not. It's four minutes of okay. All right? We're going to mute it. First ball right there hits Jalen Johnson right in the chest. Okay? And then I think this one misses Marcus just over his right shoulder. All right? Marcus came back for a second rep right there. All right? We're getting slants. And then this is a little flat ball out to the, the running back right there. These underneath stuff, it, it looked good, man. He was accurate, put it in the right spot. All right, had a, a drop or two from some running backs and some wide receivers. 
It was when we started to throw these comebacks, okay, and we start seeing that ball get a little bit loose. That ball's absolutely ripped right there. I think this one might flail on him a little bit. Y'all see that ball wobble on him just a tad yeah. as yeah. it came out of his hand, all right? That one too, okay? We see it as they go up into the air. We're losing it just a tad. Let me get that uh, uh, right there. We're losing it just a tad, and that ball will wobble on us just a hair. Anytime that ball wobbles, like I said, with these pro balls, we're going to lose some velocity, okay? We're 100% going to lose some velocity. Got another option route from the quarterback here, or from the running back here. That's a drop by Kendall. The other thing I noticed about him, just didn't seem tremendously confident throwing no. the football. No. Okay? Not ripping it. But again, to me, I, 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 can say, I can see her look at that and say, like that ball right there, that's placed. You know what I'm saying? We're kind of. great. So what? I mean, it's a great accurate. But. Yeah. That ball's ripped. Mm -hmm. Good ball there. That ball came out like it was supposed to. See here. That ball wobbled on him. Very okay, let's slow that's this one That's the worst one I've seen. Tad. Say what? That was the worst one we've seen so far. Yeah. All right. Y'all can see this. I know it's kind of a little bit tougher. I'm going to slow it down for the audience. Yeah, there you go, Kirby. You can see this ball wobble on him right here. Okay? Just a tad. And that will lead, okay, to some slower, uh, you know, arrival of the ball. It won't arrive as a violent. <clears throat> Same thing here. Gets a little loose on him, just a tad bit. Camera dealing with some ISO issues as we go to work through this. Shouts out to the NFL scouts who are standing right in the middle of the way. I love you for that. Here we go. Another route right here to Ladd. I think this is a dig he's throwing right here. So this is going to come right in front of your face. Boom. Good ball placement right there out in front of the eyes of the wide receiver. Okay. Want to have a runnable football right there. This is good ball placement. Ooh. 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 I love this from Gunner. Put me in that two shot right here. Watch his eyes right here, okay? Watch his eyes down the middle of the field on this next rep, and then he will bring them over to this uh, wide receiver, okay? Even, even when we're taking routes on air, okay? Look at his eyes right down the middle of the field, and then you'll see, boom, we'll pull him right back over, okay? Still want to remain disciplined. That, that tells me we're a disciplined football player, okay? We're looking for everything we can from this video, guys. I thought this was the most important thing that happened at the pro day because it's the one thing we hadn't seen. I hadn't seen this guy throw a football since he was playing at Hustle Inc., okay? I ain't seen this dude throw, like, out in person for real, for real, up close and personal since 2021. That ball is late. Let me ask you something. What's up? What's your thought on guys tapping the ball before they throw it? I don't care. I don't care as long as it's not drastic. Here, here's what I care about. I only got my Ray Lewis ball. All right. This segment's going to murder. All right. Oh, wow. All right. All right. Wow. All right. Look, I don't care if you're a tapper. Matter of fact, I'm a tapper. I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm tapping as a pull. But what I care about is tapping and dropping. Okay. If you're a, if you're a tapper and a dropper, we got a problem. Okay, if, you're, if, if you tap the ball and then you drop it down here instead of just letting our scat pull, like this is all we're trying to do. We're trying to get our lat back here to activate. Okay, if I can do this without dropping the ball, I don't give a shit if you tap. Joe Burrow's a tapper. Pat Mahomes is a tapper. Drew Brees was a tapper. Okay, Dylan Raul is a tapper. Ryan Puglisi is not. I don't care if you're a tapper. I, all I care about is if you're a dropper. If you're a dropper like this, if you're Tim Tebow-esque, I'm really, really concerned if you're one of these guys that has to drop, load, and kind of do this one every time we throw, I get worried, okay? Some of this feels elongated. I was going to say, because I was about to ask you, because his release Some of looks this long. feels elongated. The Florida State tape feels elongated, okay? I should be able to get into layback without reaching for it, okay? I should be able to get into this action without having to reach for this one. Everybody get that? Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah, that, that kind of answers your question just a little bit. I, I don't care if you tap. I care if you drop. All right, because look, hey man, this a, a safety from 20 yards away ain't picking shit up from that. But a safety 20 yards away is gonna pick a whole hell of a lot up from that. You know what I mean? So those, those are two different things. Okay. Tapping, dropping. Don't don't be a dropper. I don't care if you're a tapper. Some of the great ones are tappers. I'm a tapper. You know, when I when I'm when I do it's a rhythm thing, man. Throwing the football is a rhythm act. Okay. There was no drop there. You see how he kind of he pulls the lat with that mm -hmm. with that arm flat. Anytime we get down to here, we're losing efficiency. Okay. What time we got, boys? You got 16 minutes. Okay, we're still good. Should we put this back into full speed so we can see the actual life on the football? Yeah. Yes. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> hmm. 
The ball's a little high on him. Ball wobbled on him. I think this one does too. Nah, All right. Pretty tight. Yeah, but here, here's my problem. This is an out. I think it's a speed out. Oh, is either, it? It's either a speed out or a comeback. Oh. Okay. This, this is a one ball. What do I mean by that? One ball, two ball, three ball. A one ball. Uh, we don't have epic pinup. A one ball line, line shot. Trying to put that sucker on a tightrope, right? Uh, a two ball layer. Think about deep over. A runner, right? Trying to put out in front of the guy, trying some good uh, pace on the football, trying some good touch. Three ball, Russell Wilson. Trying to put that sucker to the moon, bring that thing down. Trying to scrape the sky, bring some water out the clouds. Okay? This is supposed to be a one ball. Anything coming back to the line of scrimmage, anything working outward, okay, under 15, 20 yards. Pace, acceleration, life. All right? I better, that ball better on that, on that wide receiver's face when he turns around. So, guys, when I see somebody kind of getting that high arc on that, that comeback or that out route. He's trying to throw that with anticipation. He really doesn't trust himself to really pull down on that football and rip that sucker, okay? And again, why would you? You're throwing 15 balls at this point, half of them been wobbling on you. Mm -hmm. So I, I probably would throw some anticipation as well. Now, how much of this do you think is psychological of, I'm the young guy here and this is upperclassmen's pro day. I don't want to mess this up. With yeah, them. I'm just not trying to mess it up for these guys. You know, that's a, a, a really good question, especially when you don't have confidence. I don't think the kid had confidence throwing an NFL ball. That's why I started I mean, that, with that. It's very, very. Hey, you know who I know loves throwing an NFL ball? Carson Beck. Beck. Oh, my God. It's all he talks about. If, if Carson Beck could go the rest of his life only throwing <laughs> pro balls, he would. In the offseason, all he throws is pro balls. Because I'm telling you, once you figure them out, once you figure out how to cut an NFL ball, you'll never want to throw anything else. The, the high school ball almost feels heavy. It don't, like the pro ball, the college ball almost feels heavy, thick, and, and unable to move through the air efficiently mm -hmm. once you start throwing these NFL balls. But if you don't know how to throw them, they, they, they quail like ducks. Bad, bad, bad. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. But, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be confidently throwing it if I, if I didn't have the ability to. From a – I got a lot of NFL guys standing around me. You hope that's not the case, right? You hope this guy's confident in his abilities. If, he, if he's got nerves like that in a pro day – yeah. Shit. 133, 103,000 in Knoxville not, or in Neyland Stadium, not going to feel great. You know what I mean? So, I, I don't take too much stock into it, but I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it was a great day. It, no. was, it was not Carson Beck 2021. It was not that. Okay. Carson Beck left Pro Day 2021 with a top 10 eval on somebody's board I've, that I know. <laughs> you know, that it's got like a, a, a real role in the NFL, not just some people people were talking about. And I know a lot of a lot of folks were looking at that yesterday and were like, why isn't why isn't Carson throwing? Why isn't Carson throwing? Why isn't Carson throwing? I think that was a uh, I think that might be Georgia standard. We're going to let the non starter get some rub here just to get some introductions into the NFL. Well, it's also you it's it's a pseudo eval for the starter. Like, you have to imagine that some scouts are like, oh, if Carson Beck's going to be throwing, we're going to scout him as well for our 2025 class. Which, I mean, you don't necessarily want that. What? Anything? So, Pugliese next year, maybe? You doing it already. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 I would say for oh, Pro Day. No. I would say oh, for, for pro, pro Day. day. Oh, my God. That's going to that, Yeah, please. Yeah. For Pro I Day. <laughs> I can't wait to see that kid throw. Gosh, no. I would not do that. No. People are going to do it, though. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, we, we expect this. People are going to do it. It's unfortunate. It is. But it comes with the role, right? Yeah. It's the way it goes. All right, let's finish tonight with uh, give me three. Give me three before takeaways. You, before you What's do, up? you, went, you uh, had a media availability today, right? Practice. I think we should end with you wanna, Drive Down Millage. You want to end with Drive Down Millage? Because oh, we were getting texted. Why are you today. groaning? Because I had a rough day on Millage. Oh, these I've are had, supposed I've, to be good stories. I've had a rough day. I've had a rough two days in Clark County. Oh, no. Yesterday during Pro Day, you know, they got Pro Day parking over there in Carlton Street Deck. Yeah. And Carlton Street Deck slammed. Always. Nowhere to park. Never. But you can sure as shit find a parking spot out in left field where you can get your ass hit by a baseball. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wasn't running late. I was running early, in fact. But still, no place to park. So I whip over there in the baseball parking lot. Come out pro day. I see a little, little head over by my my hood. Doing the thing. Oh, I'm like, oh, shit. I got a ticket. I got a, I, I, that's what I was hoping for. I was hoping I got a ticket. 
Nah, they booted my son. Bitch. Oh no! They booted me. It's here's, seventy-five here's the right thing. there. Here's the thing about getting booted at the University of Georgia: you get booted at the University of Georgia, you got to walk all the way to the southeast campus to pay to get your boot on, off. You yep. can't just call a wrecker and be like, "Hey, come bring your credit card machine out. I'll pay it on spot. Whatever, get my boot off like normal." You get booted in Atlanta. That's the way it works. Yeah. Nah, dog. I had to take a mile and a half walk clear across campus to pay my fees and then take a mile and a half walk back to my truck and, and hang out there. So that was yesterday. You could have just parked at my house. And then today, during my drive down Millage, all right, going over to, to the practice facility, um, come to a stoplight. I just stopped at a gas station, got something to drink, uh, a little C4 action because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a fiend. And then uh, hop back up in the truck, failed to put my seatbelt back on. That's on me. Mm. And then oh, they'll get you, dude. Yeah, yeah. So I pull up to a stoplight, <coughs> and I'm like, you know what? Phone's going hey berserk at the stoplight. Pull it up off the the phone holder, and I'm deep, 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 deep in on my dropping phone. Dropping some nugs. Yeah, dropping some nugs out here, hitting the the, the 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 tweeter machines, doing my job basically while I'm while I'm waiting for this light to turn green. And right as the light turned green, whoop whoop, uh, whoop whoop, <laughs> it's a little police officer on his motorcycle, right behind me. And I'll, I'll look at my rear view, and he sees me. He just, go on, buddy. Go on, go on. Pull your ass on over, big fella. <laughs> um, and he gave my Honda Accord driving ass a, yeah. a, a ticket. Can you believe that? Mm. So, yeah, got got booted yesterday. Got ticketed today for no seatbelt and uh, on your phone. Distracted driving. They love <laughs> like, Motherfucker, that. I was sitting still. <laughs> what, what are we doing? They love ticketing on millage. Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to stay away from that one. Not millage, not millage, because it's just too much good content driving down millage. millage is awesome. Like apparently ankle weights are back in. Ooh. Did you know girls was out here walking with ankle weights in 2024? Huh. Yeah. Ankle weights are in, and because it was north of 75 degrees outside today, every frat boy named Mama was tits out on millage today. That's the way it goes, man. Well, Mama oh, wasn't tits out, but the frat boys were. <laughs> I'd hope not. Yeah. Ankle weights. A uh, lot, a lot of beer dye going on. Yeah, I, oh, yeah. a, lot, a lot of beer dye. Still don't get that game. Don't know why. Why don't we, why don't we just play pong like normal folks? Do beer you drink during beer, beer dye? Or do you only drink the beer? You in your look hand? cooler if you play beer dye. I debate. Uh, beer dye is beer debatable. Dye, beer dye is a very fun game. Okay, I'll it's, take your word for it. It's much more active. My days of the drinking you games are over. You look more like an athlete if you play beer dye. Interesting. Oh. I would beg to differ. I would beg majorly to differ. No, Watching yeah. some of the frat boys I watch throw dye to the sky. Yeah, it's when you it's, gotta catch it's the it. Catching that, Ooh. It's the catching. It'll be quick on your feet. Ooh. You got hey, look. You gotta understand the rules of beer dye to understand the game. Hmm. There are no rules. That's no, there are there are definitely rules to beer dye. Yeah, you ain't gotta worry about it. explaining them to me. Three takeaways. What do you got? Early, early spring takeaways. All right. My first one was the defensive back room is shaping up like we, us three, kind of expected it to be with Dalen Everett kind of leading the helm, the older guy, the guy that has all the reps, with Julian Humphrey right behind him and Daniel Harris also in the mix as well. So that one, that one is to kind of like, okay, the expectation was set, and we kind of know. Second one, the wide receiver room looks to be like they're going in the right direction already. Obviously, though, we don't have much to say about them yet because it's still very early in the spring. Still trying to figure out the transfer portal guys and whatnot. But just kind of off of the early inklings that we've gotten from that group, it seems like this group is headed in the right direction. So they're going to have a lot of production out of them this sec um, this next year. And then my third one, it's kind of a depressing one, but I'm going to throw it in there. Uh-oh. Spring practice, as exciting as it is, as, as joyous as I was to come into the studio to talk about actual football today, it is also really the first realization of – all these NFL guys now are no longer on the roster. Like, I'm not getting my my first nug about, oh, Brock Bowers, year three. It's going to be something special. Or Javon Buller wreaking havoc in practice or anything like that. Like, it's just kind of where it first really hits you of like, dang, those guys are gone now. Like, they're no longer here. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good realization. I didn't even realize. Um, first By of all, the I, way, I, I mean to stop you. Uh, Jay Will, give him three. What I would tell you is it's sad that these players leave the University of Georgia. It's great that you work here because all of them are willing to come over here and do something once, they're, once they leave. And when they're at Georgia, I mean, you're at risk of losing your credential if you even talk to them. Right. So you don't really – the report that I've gotten to build with players during my time at Georgia is because of the respect of the work both ways, right? Mm -hmm. I respect the way that they play the game. They respect the way that I break it down. When they get done, they're like, bro, I really appreciate you. I'm like, no, nah, I really appreciate you. You want to come on the show? Boom, end of done, right? But 
yeah, it's great when they leave because we get better access to them. It's great while they're there because they're great players. Mm -hmm. You know, so we'll see. What do you got for me, Kerb? All right, so the first one I had, Georgia culture is unlike any other. Mm. And in all of college. Heat culture? No, no, like the way they run that program. Just because you talk about, you hear freshmen coming in and guys that come in from other programs, it's like, oh, my God, they practice so differently. Like you hear nugs about guys that have transferred in this year kind of struggling to grasp the way that they run things just because it's so difficult. Heard, there's, there's so much about it. I heard one transfer player, quote, had to have that gator washed off of him. Ooh, I wonder who that was. That stank. That stank. Stanky. That, uh, no, we're going to punch the ball here, you know. Like, don't get mad. We're going to punch the ball. Uh, you going to run to the end zone. Not just once you get past the safety, slow down. Nah, dog. Till they can't House be, call, baby. Till you can't run no more. Go on. And then Force jog it back and get the next rep, right? Like, uh, no, we don't stop at the line. We run through the line. Mm -hmm. And people are like, why? This is stupid. Or, you know, at most schools, they're like, well, who cares? Uh, champions. <laughs> champions. Exactly. champions care bro exactly. champions care um so yeah there's just there's just a learning curve man some uh you know my second takeaway was anthony evans could be a guy in 2024 the mm -hmm. things we coming in we kind of knew hey this might be one of the guys but everything that we're hearing from practice and the fact that he's not running track it seems like it's huge so i think that's going to be really he keeps a name to watch in 2024 and then the third one i have it's kind of a basic one, but I think it, it needs to be said. The injury list is long, but it's always going to be long in spring. Because if you look at yeah, that injury. Yeah, optional surgeries. Yeah, you look at the injury list. It's this guy had something lingering in 2023. They said, you know what, we'll go ahead and get it cleaned up in 2024. There's a lot of preventative measures taken in, 20, in this offseason for spring surgery. So that's why the injury list is so long. I think, I think that people see that and go like, oh, my God, there's 12 people on here. This is not good. It's not that bad. Mm. Hey, Christian Kirby, give him three. All right, I got three for you, even though two of them have already been talked about tonight. Um, number three, Dante Williams, weirdest thing I've ever seen. Uh, top five. Top five weirdest thing I've seen in practice from a college football coach. Just hop in, put the helmet on, cleats on, everything, let's get after it. That was kind of weird, but kind of cool, too. I'm sure all of his players really liked it. You know, coach yeah. still got it. You know, so that's always good to know. Um, we already talked about offensive line, already decided. It's just, we got it. We know who they're going to be. We know who's going to rotate in. We know what the rotations are going to kind of some, somewhat be. Um, we feel comfortable. They're going to be great. Uh, number one takeaway, and this isn't a practice observations takeaway. This is talking to everyone in the building. Um, I think they're going to really, really like their running back room. Not that they hadn't in years past, but I, th I think they think Trevor Etienne is going to be something. I think they really love the, the opportunity that Roger Robinson has. They know Branson's going to be back now. Um, and by the way, Nate Frazier, when he gets there, he's I, I think he's going to make an impact early as well. I think the running back room is going to be one of the stronger points on this offense. Yeah, I think this is – I think for the first time – not I don't want to say it this way, but there's so much potential in this room, more potential than there's ever really been. Like last year coming in, you knew what Dejan Edwards was, you knew what Kendall Milton was. They're both extremely solid backs, but we haven't really seen the – full potential of a Trevor Etienne, of a Roger Robinson, of a Branson Robinson. There's a lot of upside that we haven't tapped into. So I think that's kind of why you're seeing so much buzz around this running back room right now. Mm -hmm. Love hey, to hear it. If you're on your phone, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> if you're in this chat and you're watching this network and you have not subscribed and not hit that thumbs up button, then you just don't give a shit about our show. Shouts out to Kirby Smart. Shouts out to you guys. We'll see you guys on Monday.